Szanowni Państwo, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues from the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute, Ukra Patent, with the General Director, Andrei Kudin, the co-hosts of the conference on the World IP Day. Distinguished guests, participants in the conference that has gathered us all here today, I would like to welcome all of you to this meeting, to this event. I hope you will be satisfied with the meeting that gathers us here. Nevertheless, may I especially warmly welcome a representative of the Ukrainian Ministry of Economy, Director Andrei Dimchuk, Director of the Department for the Development of Intellectual Property. He is with us online. And Director Karolus Gutka, Director of the Media and Creative Sectors uh, Department of our Ministry of Culture and National Heritage, who is presence, present here in person. May I very warmly welcome all of you, gentlemen, for being with us. On this exceptional day, may I ask for the special message from the Director General of World Intellectual Property Office, Darren Tang, and Minister Mariusz Golecki, Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Development and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, IP Day is a very special day and moment, unique and extraordinary as there is a war raging on the other side of the Polish-Ukrainian border, the Russian war. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad that even in such a small manner can we express our support for what you do for you. I do hope that you will survive, that you will win. I'm certain because good always wins and you are on the side of good. On behalf of all the staff of the Patent Office of the Republic of Poland and the entire IP world and in my own name, a profound respect for your determination and courage in the fight. We are greatly impressed and we'd like to thank you very much for what you're doing. Now, could we all listen to the address by the General Director, Darren Tang, who very succinctly and as is his manner, greatly will introduce us to the uh, subject of this year's day, IP and the young people for the uh, structuring and building of a better future. IP, where IP is not just a legal right, but a powerful catalyst for jobs, investments, business growth, and ultimately economic and social development for all countries. As part of this, we need to develop a more inclusive IP ecosystem that works for everyone, everywhere. One that connects not just with IP specialists and IP experts, but with new, broader and more diverse communities around the world at the ground level. Global youth, our future innovators and creators, are at the heart of this work. Today, around half of the global population is around 30, and it is the fastest growing demographic in many parts of the world. This new generation of innovators and creators are already devising inventive ways of tackling local and global challenges. From developing tech platforms that deliver better healthcare to women and children in remote areas of India and Cameroon, to finding new ways of bringing STEM education to pupils in Ghana, to building cutting-edge solutions that are reducing carbon footprints in Mexico and France, young people are not just speaking up about the world that they want to see, they are taking action to make it happen. This year on World Intellectual Property Day, WIPO is celebrating the vision and dynamism of young innovators and creators everywhere. And at a time when humanity needs to come together to address a range of urgent challenges, from overcoming the pandemic to combating climate change and many others, we must help our youths to realize their innovation and creative potential. Yet we know that many young innovators and creators have only a limited awareness of IP and the role it can play in bringing their innovation journey forward. So that's why this year's World IP Day is an opportunity to close that gap. 
WIPO is working with many of you to develop new initiatives that will help youths use IP to translate their ideas into world-changing products and services. And that's why we're also encouraging our partners around the world to create programs that speak to the aspirations and needs of young people. Let us work together to ensure that the next generation have a voice in our conversations and debates about the future of the world. And let us give them the tools to shape this future by unleashing their innovative and creative potential. I'm very pleased to be able to celebrate World IP Day with all of you today, and we look forward at WIPO to working with you to bring about a world where IP truly serves everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director. That was General Director of WIPO. Thank you very much for all the warm words in this address. Our IP Day conference is entitled which is Let's Play Protection Intellectual Property in the World of Games. It consists of three parts. Immediately after the opening addresses, we have for you special keynotes from Dr. Maciej Kawecki, President of Stanisław Lem Poland of the Future Institute. On the Ukrainian side, we will have Natalia Kura of the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. The first panel following it will discuss how to support and protect innovation and creativity of the young people. We will hear from Ms. Joanna Gogolinska, President of Advanced Technologies Institution, and we will also have the Teacher of the Year in, from a school in Jastrzębie Zdrój, from the Ministry of Education and Science. We will have Ms. Anna Hroszczycka, and our Ukrainian partner will be present, uh, represented by Ms. Anna Stefan from the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. In the second panel, we'll speak of the challenges in the game dev uh, sector. Marcin, Dr. Marcin Balicki will discuss IP, so would one of our patent attorneys. We will have Kinga Palinska on behalf of one of the game dev studios, and Ukraine will be represented by Maria Stolbova. And then we'll have Anna Dachowska representing our patent office. Part three will focus on the support that the game dev sector needs today. And here we will have Mateusz Witczak, the editor of polishgamedev.pl. We'll have Tomasz Topolewski and Mr. Marcin Seva from the Ministry of Technology and Development. The third part will be moderated by Andrzej Zuzuliuk of the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. And we will have Richard Frelek on behalf of WIPO. This is the program. This is the agenda for today. Of course, do participate actively. Do ask your questions. Should you have any doubts, concerns, and comments? And now, may I ask to the floor, Director of the Department for IP Development from the Ministry of Economy of uh, Ukraine, Mr. Andrei Demchuk. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much for this absolutely unique opportunity. It probably doesn't need explaining a lot what's happening in Ukraine. I actually understand most things that are said in are Polish, however, let me continue in Ukrainian. At this difficult time, may I welcome all the IP community, all the world IP community at this time so difficult for Ukraine. May I also extend my gratitude to the Polish Patent Office for organizing this IP Day, Intellectual Property Day, together with UKR uh, Patent and international partners. We run a range of projects concerning intellectual property. Unfortunately, Russia uh, 
Russia's military aggressively invaded Ukraine, and for that year we cannot organize that feast of IP people at an appropriate level. We're now scattered all around the country. Uh, many are in Ukraine, some are abroad. I'm in Lviv, and may I now thank our Polish partners for this opportunity to join the project, to join this uh, meeting. Intellectual property has for years been the foundation for development of a favorable investment environment, reinforcing a certain opportunity for improving intellectual property conditions. IP is valid for the contemporary world and it attracts the people's attention. The subject that this meeting is devoted to is innovation. That's a new language, actually. And the meeting today is also very valid for education. That's important. We are a significant player in this field, and our Ukraine finds GameDev an important area as well. There are plenty inventors, programmers, game dev developers in the world, and the question of protection of IP plays a key role in the use, in the production of video games. May I once again thank the Patent Office of the Republic of Poland and the international partners for the support. Once again, may I welcome all and sundry on this great feast of the IP world, and thank you very much for organizing this meeting. Thank you very much, Director. Could I now ask to the floor the Under Secretary of State, Mariusz Jerzy Golecki of the Ministry of Development and Technology. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to the conference today. It is a real pleasure to welcome you on this special day when we celebrate and observe the IP Day. May I welcome very cordially Edita Dembysiwek, the President of the Polish Patent Office, Mr. Andrzej Demchuk, representative of the Ministry of Economy of Ukraine, and the Director General of the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute, Mr. Andrzej Kudin. Equally warmly, I would like to welcome all the speakers, both the Polish and the Ukrainian, and all those who listen to us, who watch us, who connect from the various corners of the world. Participation in this conference is possible thanks to the quickly developing technology, the technology that makes it possible for us to connect from anywhere in the world. It's so in the games dev world as well. And game dev is the leading subject today. The game dev sector in the world, the video game sector, is today far greater than music or film. And as far as the leaders in the video game sector are the Americans and the Japanese, we must say that Central and Eastern Europe also has a significant range of achievements here. The Polish games are dev sector, entered the world's spearhead, we are in the top 20 and produce more than 600 games a year. The value of the Polish uh, video game sector is growing from year to year, the dynamic growth being reflected in the number of, for example, Polish versions of foreign games. It does not surprise that the forced stay at home, forced by lockdown, increase the interest in games as a form of spending your free time. More than three in every ten uh, respondents 
adult respondents say that in the pandemic they've played more than usually. This is a global trend, not only a trend of the Polish market. Today we're celebrating the World IP Day and precisely yesterday we are sent the law on intellectual property to, for consultations so that the Polish law would be harmonized with a dynamically changing economic environment. We know that intellectual and industrial property is in the heart of what the game dev sector and the video games uh, sector are involved in. The protection of those elements is extremely important. May I wish you plenty of fruitful discussion, inspiring exchange of opinions, good fun, both in the virtual world and here in the real. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I believe that we all agree that intellectual property in the games world is the core and the crooks and the heart of our interest. It is a very interesting and very attractive course to follow. May I now ask Director of the Media and Creative Sectors Department of the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage to take the floor. Karol Suchotka for you. Distinguished Ms. President, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Prime Minister Piotr Gliński, may I thank very cordially the Polish Patent Office for organizing a conference devoted to the protection of intellectual property in the video games development sector and for inviting Ministry of Culture to participate in this conference. The World IP Day we celebrate today is a perfect opportunity to talk and discuss how we can and should support innovation and creativity. The fact that the discussion that has gathered us here today, you decided to devote precisely to the video game sector is very positively appreciated by the Ministry. This choice proves that the games have found their proper place in the reflection on uh, the public culture. Now we no longer see the games dev sector as one of the branches of the toy sector. Like film in the past, it is now an important part of the modern culture and economy. Of all the Polish creative sectors, the video uh, games production sector has the greatest potential for development. Polish games are now our global call card. A historical moment and we can't simply oversee it. Missing it would mean losing plenty of advantages and benefits of cultural and economic nature generated by the Polish video games sector. Building a powerful sector can today be one of the most efficient means and tools for building the national soft power. The growing significance of the IP-based uh, sectors combined with the high attractiveness of the jobs they offer results in the development of such policies by many countries. The most efficient and example of contemporary soft cultural soft power is the American cinema. Its works shape the global imagination on global scale. Now the video game sector has already uh, overtaken the uh, film sector. The video game sector, due to the specificity of this um, sector, of the way that it is interacted with, proved resilient to lockdowns. Perhaps now games will be the medium that will really uh, play the tone for the global imagination at par with Hollywood. Thanks are due to the Patent Office also for cooperating very closely with the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute in that very difficult time. May I thank our Ukrainian guests very warmly for participating, for being with a Polish partner. A great respect to the Polish game dev developers you probably see the reaction of Polish game developers to the uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine. The scale of assistance is huge. It's not only finance, but also premises and discontinuation of distribution of games in the Russian market. 
And um, the Russian retaliation, like grave bombing, were not something to stall the creativity of the game dev, which is a magnificent and empathic uh, community. May the number of such communities in our society be the greatest. I wish you a fruitful time and great discussions to reinforce the creative video game sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director. May I now ask to the floor Mr. Oleksii Tkaczuk, the Department of our Department for Applications in the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. Dr. Tkaczuk deals with trademarks as well as patents. Ms. President, my friends and partners from WIPO, distinguished panelists and audience on behalf of the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute and our whole team, may we extend our warmest wishes on the World IP Day. This is the beginning of the conference that we were all waiting for. Together with our international colleagues, we're working on the development and sustenance also of this field of IP. Innovation is a subject that goes beyond just the World IP Day. It also gives us some opportunity for um, sharing information, for sharing what we all have before us. We will work for the sake of young creators and innovators and artists, and I hope that this will result in plentiful new research. Also, the community of experts in IP will do anything to protect that innovation properly and to have it monetized. May I wish you very fruitful time and projects. Unfortunately, due to the situation in Ukraine, uh, General Director Kudin cannot be with us online. However, I wanted to share uh, his recording for the start of our conference. Distinguished Ms. President Edita Dembeshivak, partners of the World Intellectual Property Office and of EU Patent Offices, distinguished representatives of the Polish and Ukrainian uh, ministries, dear colleagues. First of all, I'd like to express gratitude in my own name and on behalf of all the patent team for co-organizing this event. It is so important that today, as partners and friends, I'm not exaggerating, we can work for the sake, for the benefit and for the good of the global IP protection system. We believe that even in a time that is so difficult for Ukraine, we can and we do remember about the development of the knowledge system and all the projects that can support creators, inventors and also our homesteads, our families. The IP Day is when intellectual property blossoms. It's a global stimulus for developing that. It is our mission, one that we're going to follow independent of the circumstances that may hamper us. We shall continue and we shall go on proving this to the whole world. It is also a great contribution of our world's intellectual partners and WIPO and EU with its patent offices support us, chiefly the Polish patent office. Like many, many our friends do, managers, experts from different departments dealing with intellectual property who support, not only support, but who offer us practical aid. This lets us not only win, but even continue to develop. 
we find it a powerful impulse for further development. On the World IP Day, I'd like to emphasize that this marks a better future for our young. That's why we're also going to discuss the video games sector. Today in the Ukraine, this is one of the best developed creative economy sectors. Present today in this market are the game dev studios as well as outsourcing studios and game dev and IT startups that ensure the development of games worldwide. They all produce plenty of uh, IP um, assets that are successfully defended, that are successfully protected. We know that what comes to us is not only useful knowledge, but also inspiration to develop our own products. Innovation and creativity have always been a common denominator of the global peace and well-being. May I wish you a very effective and productive day. Thank you very much for your attention. W tym momencie chciałbym poprosić raz jeszcze o zabranie głosu panią prezes urzędu Pani Ask now to the floor once again Edyta Dęby Siwek president of the Polish Patent Office. Dzień państwo. Greetings again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank for all the warm words addressed to us uh, and coming from representatives of the Ukr Patent and the Ukrainian Ministry of the Economy. Dear friends, you will prevail, you will rebuild your country also uh, taking advantage of uh, intellectual property law. And I'm sure that uh, your compatriots will be the inventors uh, of uh, many things that will serve to build a better world. world. The uh, Polish gaming industry is no longer a niche of the entertainment branch uh, of industry. Uh, as uh, our minister just said, it is an important part uh, of our cultural and economic produce. Um, however, the choice of adequate legal protection is uh, uh, is very important. However, it is not easy to decide about the shape of that protection. Uh, the market uh, changes. Uh, by the day, and as I heard someone say, it is so dynamic that it can be likened to uh, building a house uh, during an earthquake. Even though the earthquake uh, continues to exist, uh, game uh, builders, game coders uh, need protections. Uh, is copyright sufficient, uh, comes the question, or should we uh, base our reasoning on the protection of industrial property, or maybe just uh, um, start from scratch and develop a whole new legal uh, protection concept. As uh, the Minister Golecki just said yesterday, um, it was publicized uh, that um, a bill was developed uh, about um, uh, the um, novelty or rather the uh, update of uh, our 20-year-old uh, industrial protection law, in industrial protection rights law. Uh, and this uh, bill, which uh, was um, developed uh, with our collaboration, hopefully will expedite the procedures in the Patent Office. 
uh, and this is very important for one of the most dynamic industries uh, in uh, our economy. That way, protection will be granted earlier and enforcement thereof will be more effective. Uh, and, um, well, perhaps it's not the games per se that can be protected by patents. It is um, a computer program which is not patent protected. However, uh, uh, implements that we use to play, uh, for example, a pad, is a technical invention and can be patented. And, uh, Extending uh, our uh, assistance uh, to young people who develop games um, will benefit uh, from an early uh, protection. As the director uh, said, uh, toys uh, can be protected as industrial designs. Uh, so if we uh, fall back uh, to the toy concept of games, then that could also be a base for their protection. We want to urge uh, young innovators um, to uh, seek uh, legal protection. Uh, we want to reduce uh, fees for granting such protection. And if you come to the conclusion that your uh, solution uh, merits several um, protection schemes, then we came up with the idea uh, which we called IP Combo. <clears throat> you could uh, file for uh, reduced fees if um, in a short span of time uh, you um, apply for uh, several protection uh, schemes. I will not go into details. Do read the bill. It is already uh, available on the RCL pages, and uh, you are invited to um, post your uh, comments. Uh, so the consultation process started today. A 30-day period uh, has just started, so take advantage. And hopefully, we will contribute to the development of this very dynamic industry. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a fruitful meeting. Thank you, uh, Madam President. This was the last of the presentations in the opening stage, and now we move on to the subject matter part of our meeting. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maciej Kawetski, uh, who will talk about innovations in the digital world. He represents the Poland of the Future Stanisław Lem Institute. I'm afraid we don't hear the speaker. Of dzisiejszym spotkaniu. And well, my um, lecture here will be a success propaganda uh, pitch. Uh, that is what I try to uh, do on a daily basis, showcasing startups, young innovators, young technologists, because uh, of the varied forms of propaganda. This one is actually needed in Poland. If we look at how many people in Poland want to change the world, or already are changing the world, <coughs> The numbers are head spinning. So, uh, apart from the fact that they develop their product and they um, are granted the protection that uh, this institution grants, they also uh, need uh, other participants of the process. Uh, for uh, today's uh, format, I decided to speak of trends. 
I will discuss uh, the latest technological trends which are decisive for the face of the world of innovation. And uh, I want to focus on the startups uh, of innovative technologies. And I feel that they are something to showcase because they already change the world or can be changing the world in the nearest future. And you may find them useful. Trends which are determined by uh, societal change uh, that we experience uh, as we speak. Uh, but uh, I would like to start with the literature and uh, uh, metaphor, uh, since we uh, have our patron in the, in the person of the late Stanislav Lem. Uh, if we ask what is the most well Slavic, most well known Slavic word, you will say pierogi, others would say vodka. Uh, and others would maybe say Robert uh, Lewandowski, Jan Paweł II, and uh, or Krakow, uh, and so on. Uh, we have many of these words, but uh, the word is a robot, and it was uh, coined by Karel Czapek 100 light, uh, so, sorry, 100 years ago. Um, Czapek uh, created humanoids which were to assist people uh, in daily life. Uh, so uh, robot uh, is uh, something coined from robota, which is slave work. And so first robots were to assist, then they were to uh, supersede humans. Uh, uh, and finally, they superseded humans completely, killing all humans. And uh, this um, play w became extremely famous, even made it to Broadway. And then the word robot uh, made its uh, career. And Chapek showed uh, what will happen if we traverse the uh, borderline, the boundary between what is human and what is technical. It will lead to disaster. Uh, so today's inventions should put humans in the center, just as Stanislav Lem did uh, in each and every of his writings, uh, placed uh, the human being uh, in the center, always focused on the human being. Uh, today, for example, we are um, facing a crisis of health care. In all health care systems, in all countries, even the most uh, uh, clever and effective ones are also struggling. Uh, there is a growing number of uh, disease cases, not least due to the pandemic. Um, they are struggling to address the needs that emerge. And it turns out that uh, the crisis of health uh, requires responses uh, based on technology, telemedicine, for example. Uh, those are the sub-trends that I have identified here. Those are solutions which are able, in some way, to uh, reduce the burden of the healthcare system to provide online contacts with patients, but not like today that we call a, a doctor by phone. Uh, no, we uh, want to have solutions that will make it possible for the doctor to actually see uh, our sore throat uh, and so on. This is uh, a frame uh, that I mm, recorded in CS in Las Vegas. Uh, this was um, a fair presenting um, uh, inventions, uh, and this is uh, a mouse, we could call it, which was invented by Polish innovators. Uh, and this um, invention can show a doctor the inside of our uh, oral cavity, the teeth, the throat, the nasopharyngeal cavity, it can take an ECG, uh, it can uh, measure oxygenation of our blood, and uh, the um, online platform um, is uh, cost about ten dollars uh, month and it is very popular all over the world. Um, so this kind of telemedicine makes it possible uh, to uh, apply new solutions. And this uh, in um, Las Vegas was presented uh, 
um, in various uh, trade fairs. Um, so, who who are the keynote speakers? Uh, what is uh, attractive for organizers? The organizers. Um, uh, gauge trends, and this is one of the examples where they also put this in focus. And this is a photo that I took a month ago when I had a talk uh, in Miami uh, with a Polish startup called C, uh, developed uh, at the University of Warsaw, uh, and uh, this uh, invention uh, was. Uh, awarded at a MedTech uh, meeting in Malta. It was named the uh, technology of the, of the year, and it was called Digital Therapeutic. Today, we have uh, issues with our mental well-being. We have an increasing need for psycho-oncological care. So patients with cancer require such assistance. No, turb uh, no typical uh, psychological counseling and uh, no family members are able to uh, provide that, and digital uh, therapeutics are thus made available. There are countries in the world where digital therapeutics are treated as if they were pharmacological entities. They are prescribed uh, and uh, they undergo clinical trials. Uh, for example, an enhanced re reality um, headset is placed uh, on somebody's head and um, uh, for example, we can uh, select uh, the next scene uh, as if we were watching Netflix selecting the next scene. And this is uh, a choice of uh, images and other uh, sensory input that is posted. So in London and Miami, um, they they are already present, and I asked them why Miami because uh, they told me uh, the investors uh, we can find there can take the risk uh, the risk of um, putting their money uh, into something that will take a long time to provide return. This um, artificial ear, uh, known as Cygnus, uh, has been. Uh, developed uh, in uh, the Faculty of Chemistry uh, of uh, <coughs> the uh, University of Warsaw. And what you see here is 3D printing, but it's bioprinting, it's tissue printing. Today, we are able to print silicon organs, and then in the lab, they can be overgrown with natural tissue is so as to make it possible for us uh, to uh, create such implants. Uh, they are implanted and thus uh, accepted better by the country. This uh, looks like science fiction, but it is the interface of biotechnology and uh, technical solutions and biosignus um, was the first uh, to um, develop so-called glass printing, which can reinforce uh, fiber optic cables. We are in a dataist society, the world of data cult, and such solutions make it possible. And this is um, an OR where I was allowed to participate in Zabrze, in, in a surgery, where a Polish startup, Medup, uh, was performing uh, one of the first worldwide operations uh, to remove uh, an osteoma uh, of the sphenoid sinus. Uh, the sphenoid sinus is placed deep in our heads, um, it was contained. It was uh, affected by a tumor, and if not for enhanced reality, this patient would have died by now. But, uh, but Professor Orłowska, who was the operator, 
Uh, he said that for the 25 years of her career as a neurosurgeon, oncological neurosurgeon, she uh, never had to operate such a complex uh, tumor. So the uh, mixed reality headset that she used, she was able to manipulate in the air, uh, rotating the tumor in such a way as to um, remove the tumor at the optimum site uh, so as to avoid damaging the optic nerve uh, to uh, cause uh, uh, lethal hemorrhage uh, from the internal carotid artery uh, to uh, avoid a tap uh, of uh, the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, there was uh, a, a, an interesting trait of this uh, meeting of surgeons. The surgeons were in the minority, technicians were in the majority. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there is also a medical entity in Poland where 90, 80 to 90 percent of uh, surgeries are performed by robots. Uh, it is located in Kline, uh, in Krakow. Uh, if uh, you have uh, uh, prostate cancer, uh, uterine uh, or ovarian cancer, um, then uh, surgery can be performed by a robot for you. And another uh, startup, Biocam, um, an endoscopic camera, uh, the uh, very disturbing endoscopic gastrointestinal examinations uh, can be performed by this. Such capsules were already existing uh, in earlier uh, years, uh, but uh, they were extremely expensive. One examination cost 5,000 euros. So, uh, prophylaxis cannot be exercised that way. Plus, the capsule was not able to harvest biopsies. And it also was not very effective in diagnosing cancers. And this capsule performs 55,000 photographs in the GI tract. And then a team of experts diagnoses, diagnoses all pathologies only based on photographs, and thanks to the algorithm, the doctor receives a report with very effective uh, visualization, and uh, it also examines temperature of cells. It turns out that cancer cells have a different temperature than normal cells, and thus they can be differentiated in this examination. So um, they are on the eve of commercialization. Uh, the next uh, important trend is climatic transformation, um, and we're looking for uh, renewable energy sources and others. I will just show you several um, uh, issues. Um, this is perovskite. This is a natural uh, raw material which ma uh, which can accumulate energy. It is one of the few natural. Uh, resources which even can generate energy or collect energy at night. Of course, it is much less effective, but uh, these uh, devices which are printed on paper, for example, and are flexible, um, they are very open or amenable to integrate or to be integrated. Uh, the first factory thereof uh, has been launched in Wrocław. The second one will start in Japan, start working in Japan. And uh, pretty soon we uh, will be able uh, to uh, use automatic uh, price modifications thanks to uh, uh, such uh, printed price tags. Um, this is the inventor. The, the project uh, was started in Spain. It's a Polish company, however, it's being commercialized in Poland. And this is Professor Piotr Piorkowski in the Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, he is the 
uh, creator and co-creator of the only technology that can supersede lithium-ion batteries, the ones that are today applied in electric uh, cars. Electric vehicles today have small ranges between 200 and 400 kilometers. This is still a very short range, uh, while um, charging takes um, overall 12 hours. We don't have fast charges in adequate supply, uh, neither in Poland nor all over Europe. What is the issue of uh, lithium-ion batteries? They have a very low density of storing energy. And this Polish inventor created um, a solid electrolyte which has a threefold higher density of energy storage compared to the lithium-ion battery. Today, a 120 kilo weighing battery uh, uh, is sufficient uh, to 300 to, to give a range, provide a range of 300 uh, kilometers, uh, whereas a lithium ion battery of the same weight gives 100 kilometers range. Uh, so this is already pat patent protected um, and um, uh, being, is being adopted by one of the largest uh, automotive companies in the world. And uh, this is um, a technology <coughs> which uh, taps light energy from glass panes. Um, the glass panes uh, are, have a reduced transparency only by 5%, and it can be practically applied anywhere, but also in the automotive sector, because such a system is able to um, charge the cockpit of the car. Therefore, the energy uh, in a battery will only uh, drive the uh, powertrain in an EV. Uh, biologization of technology. This is the most controversial part because it is the closest to our skin. IVG, uh, live technology, uh, reduction of uh, human footprints, transhumanism in practice. Uh, it applies um, human cells which can transform uh, um, into any cells of the body. That means that uh, both a male and a female can have children of their own accord, parthenogenetically. Uh, hopefully, the world will not follow that path, uh, but it, this uh, technology can be used to other ends. Uh, Bioelectra, Pavel Miller, the co-creator, it's not really a startup, but uh, uh, this is a wonderful technology, one of the most uh, uh, effective um, sewage treatment systems or wastewater treatment systems, which, uh, as long as it functions, has not discharged uh, any waste uh, to the general system. Why? Because it has such a good algorithm, effective algorithm, that um, they are able to pinpoint the desired temperature, time and pressure, uh, which is optimum for the uh, reduction of the uh, treated wastewater. Uh, and uh, this leads to the emergence of a fully biodegradable uh, residual mass. Uh, and uh, almost 100% of this goes back into the recycling loop. This is a technology that has already been applied from Australia to Europe, uh, including Poland, and uh, I urge you to read about it. Theoretically, they are still a startup because they're so new. Um, the world of mirror images, uh, we have digitized everything. By now, the Internet uh, houses information and, and transmits it. Uh, we have digitized contacts between people. We have developed uh, mixed, enhanced, uh, and other reality, virtual reality. And we have not yet uh, uh, 
gone into uh, digitizing emotions, but uh, this has already started. We call that metaverse. Uh, metaverse. If you have enhanced reality goggles, uh, you can um, stay at home and meet your friends, have a beer with them, and soon we will be able to do the same thing with haptic gloves, which adapt to what we do if we take this kind of remote control into our hand and it uh, has a temperature of 19 uh, degrees centigrade and the uh, temperature will be forwarded uh, through these haptic gloves to our hands and we will actually feel 19 degrees. And this metaverse uh, concept uh, was developed not by Zuckerberg, it's uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, idea. Uh, I read such stuff about four books a week. Um, Hawking called it Meta Universe. Um, this is the short history of time, his cult book. He said that uh, the world will go that way, and it actually does go that way. And he called it not Metaverse, but Meta Universe. Um, and there is a Polish startup which is active in that area. These guys come from Lublin. Uh, Microcamp, uh, they uh, developed the technology of millimeter waves. If uh, we ask uh, what will follow 5G, those are millimeter waves, so-called millimeter waves, which is even uh, more uh, effective in uh, transmitting uh, information via fiber optic cables. Uh, they already developed a tuner uh, which is uh, able to uh, assist in storage of such data. Uh, this is the only, this has a Polish component. This is the only startup which does not have Polish roots, but it has a partly Polish team working on it. The only startup which I do not condone at all. This is called Data Gen, uh, located in Israel. And this is a startup which answers the question what to do to enhance, further enhance AI. We have shared so many information. We play such exhibitionists that natural data is sufficient to feed AI. AI learns from data. So synthetic data have been developed. Um, Israeli citizens uh, had been asked to a studio, a room like this one, they were photographed and then artificial uh, photographs were shown. This woman does not exist. This is uh, a virtual photograph and they created packets of these photographs to sell them to Asian companies to further feed AIs that uh, make decisions affecting humans. So AI is being fed artificial data developed through algorithms in order to uh, enhance algorithms uh, that later will take um, decisions about human beings. I think this is on the other side of the thin red line that we should not cross. This is another element, a commerce. So it's e-commerce and AI, re-city, so that's changing the urban space and cybersecurity. For the shortage of time, I'm not mentioning all the startups that operate within this area. However, this is a trend that is very well seen here. In IoT, Internet of Things, we've got plenty of innovation and technologies that operate in Poland that change the world, adjusting those objects of city use to our needs. These globalizations are, are going towards globalization, but we also have deglobalization as a trend. We've had enough of it. We focus on the local, on the territorial, and it is also visible in creation of startups. More and more businesses, more and more innovators arrive, even if building things abroad, they participate in this very good trend. Those who worked globally may return to Poland, may invest in Poland, they stay in our country. And this is something that we wish to have in greater and greater amounts. And thank you very much for your attention. I don't want to go on. 
and recently the European Patent Office uh, delivered the results of a study that probably falsifies the reality a bit. This shows that when we look at the proportions of our citizens and others, we come at number second when it comes to the number of applications in the European Patent Office. We're number two following Portugal. And this proves that we are a highly creative nation, geniuses. What we are short of are investments today, other than public institutions, we have only 320 of those. So it could be great if we could have far more such investors, people who would invest into startups. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Doctor, for this highly inspiring presentation. It's been a great help to uh, understand many things. We normally work here, observe Polish startups, but to see them all gathered together in this form has been highly inspiring and so important for us. May I invite now Ms. Natalia Huro, our next keynote speaker, representative of the Academy of Intellectual Property at the UK Patent, who will speak of education in our edu in IP. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Thank you very much for this opportunity that I've had to share my experience. And I'd like to thank for the support. I wish you um, peace, first of all. I've had an opportunity to work on numerous international um, projects and in a moment I'll start my presentation and I'll try to share the ideas for gamification, how you can use it in IP, for IP. We started our project with young people from school, and we realized that those generations are different, and the difference is that at an early age, the contemporary children learn technologies, learn gadgets at a much earlier age. They are well versed with smartphones, with computers, with other electronic devices at a much earlier age. Young people the generation coming into this world know technology from the early years. They have access to the um, technologies, but they also have a powerful information burden. Before, you only used one or two channels to share information. Now that differs, and that's where the difference sets in. Now, uh, with the option of quick access to the internet, you can also use plenty of computer games and you'll be very quickly submerged in this virtual world. So you find it difficult being a child to tell apart virtual reality from the real world. 
Well, the previous generations would more use those opener games to understand the contemporary children we need to remember that children find it very easy to access everything they won't be bored the direct development of technologies the development of the industry makes children very involved and it's a perhaps good thing also when you're a parent to see that yes children can play on their own with all the electronics but they should also play one with another as things used to be before this finds translation into the creativity of the contemporary children earlier children didn't find it easy to satisfy their needs and children were often bored and uh, they could probably start creatively looking for uh, ways of having fun and that developed creativity among children today's children have no such options and they can't get bored and this means that they are not that creative unfortunately we are looking at this uh, generational change and we see that there are two ways of sharing information speaking of education we have edutainment which means gaining knowledge that's education through uh, entertainment and also gamification which is the use of practices and knowledge in a context that is not connected to games for problem solving there is no subject at school that would teach them IP for example all they have is practical experience things that let them obtain various forms of education and we decided that it could be good to give them in this way uh, some form of learning intellectual property and its importance we did it for children so that they could have some idea how to tell apart IP objects we just show them some things so that they could see what IP extends to and uh, this was a way how we tried to encourage the children to understand to interpret those categories children were also expected intuitively to confront all those uh, categories then there was a short uh, animation about Graham Bell the man who invented the telephone and that was an animated story and children could easily take in this information for more advanced elements we used gamification competition positioning a competitive positioning and we compared the budget of Ukraine to the revenue of individual companies the revenue of Ukrainian sovereign budget to the pricing to the value of the largest brands in the world so that's how we presented those speaking of intellectual property well a child finds such information difficult 
and it's difficult to understand it. So it has to be explained in an interesting and simple manner. The tasks we give to children also make use of gamification to explain the absolute foundations of intellectual property. Children were given assorted challenges for solving this material received various variant options. There was a task about a monkey that took a selfie that was actually a mandrilla. And then a question was asked, who was the author of the photograph? In the second task, we asked children whether you can use music without the author's permission. And then we said, what is necessary to use music, how you can do it, how to do it legally and fairly, first of all. We also posed some tasks in copyright tasks that explain to children who the author is in the case of underage people taking, for example, a photograph, a photograph of parents who can receive the prize and who the author is. There were also questions connected to the registration of a trademark, whether children can do it children had their ideas for solutions and at the end we told them who was right and who wasn't, who thought along the official lines, who did not. And one of the tasks was the development of a time machine. We wanted to uh, tell the children whether something like that can be created. This is after all, something that is very important. Now I'm trying to show that some things are not patentable, and uh, we wanted to the children to understand that there is a concept of patentability. In the interactive world, of course, there is gamification in the process of education, about IP and as such it envisages that such content is shared through interaction and through interactivity as a method. Uh, solving those tasks you needed to plunge into the real life. We had a story about Victoria Beckham, someone everyone knows, a celebrity, who came to... Sorry, uh, the sound is very poor. I can't hear. And there was also uh, Louis Vuitton's creative director, Jacobs, who noticed that what she used was uh, a counterfeit thing and then uh, children were supposed to um, put themselves into the shoes of Mark Jacobs. What to do if you see a counterfeit Mark Jacobs project with such a celebrity? How to solve that problem? Of course, children coped with it very well. They understood, they saw the emotions, they knew that they can take various decisions, and they were very interested in uh, doing it interactively, however, uh, accounting for the mm, reality of those. In those moments, you introduce an element of uh, rivalry of contest and we didn't have a ranking scale and all that let children learn better. All this information also helped them to form habits and this is also connected to the use of tablets, mobile telephones, uh, 
notebooks at the end of any uh, each lesson we suggested a game they could use QR code and then receive some virtual awards prizes we have those QR codes that our children could scan we asked children to share um, their input, to provide feedback, and we received the statistics on the attitudes of children, on their opinions, and it was very um, good, very useful for the students who received information in an interesting manner, but also for the teacher who could very quickly understand, nearly in no time at all, what children understood and to what extent they found it interesting. Obviously, in the Prospective development, gamification lets teachers uh, reduce the intergenerational barriers and communicate better, especially with the younger people. This can be very useful for a lot of fields in which this could be applied. Our experience shows that the involvement of children through gamification into IP subjects was on average 75%, so 15 out of 25 children provided very good answers and they saw very good they showed very good attitudes these are elements that uh, favor gamification and a better educational um, environment now interactive education can now be more accessible more available to people may I now move to cam touch Ukrainian standards. They were introduced by a young e Ukrainian uh, creator. He was in the last class of the primary school. You can change, you can uh, turn any surface into an active surface. It is now uh, certified by the Ministry of Ukraine and it's ready for use. In peaceful circumstances, the use of the achievement of that startup will be very efficient globally. Of course, with all the advantages of gamification, we must also mention its shortages and the downsides. That's a new aspect of education, something that needs fine-tuning and that certainly also needs um, tweaking. Speaking of gamification, it doesn't always do everything that we need for education. It won't harm, it won't give us bad um, results, but it may fail to provide a certain educational aspect as we see in other um, situations and other circumstances. We simply know that there is some information that calls for systematic and methodological approach. They must be persistently used and implemented. And this is not what gamification offers. In more long-term perspective, it can uh, damage our analytical or children's analytical habits because the game mechanisms may uh, hamper, may really um, disturb the main process of acquiring knowledge. 
where we used these for intellectual property that was highly efficient as we uh, could run various lessons, various classes, and they were not conducted daily. Some of them were monthly sessions, monthly meetings, and so learning certain aspects uh, was much easier through gamification. Gamification was more efficient. Thank you for your attention, and I guess that our experience, experience coming from our academy will be of use for all of us, and we will go on fine-tuning and honing the educational systems as far as IP is concerned, and we'll use new technologies, new methods to take in the knowledge of IP, and also the young generation will uh, take it in. I wish you peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for introduction into gamification in education in IP. I believe we all agree that the use of the technology that brings together games and education may, although it does not have to, as it was remarked, but it does, I believe, give us good results. That was the last our keynote speech in the opening of our conference, and I believe that we're through a good start. Now could I invite you to a moment's break, and we will reconvene at uh, a quarter to 11 Central and uh, Eastern European time, CEST, summertime. We'll talk about innovation and creativity of young people. Uh, please don't... Uh,
Dzień dobry Państwu, serdecznie witamy po przerwie. Witamy w pierwszym panelu konferencji Grasz w ochronę własność intelektualna. We welcome you to the first panel today. It's a conference on games co-organized by the Polish Patent Office and the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. During this one hour that we have for our discussion, we would consider how to support and protect innovation and creativity of young people. We'll try to answer the question how to create the best supportive climate for pro-innovation activity of young people, how to encourage young people to search us, to heart searching for the passions, developing them. Yes, it is a very difficult element. And hopefully we will learn about initiatives, tools and programs that support both teachers and young people in uh, establishing uh, pro-innovative uh, activity set. And we have uh, guests <coughs> here at the Patent Office of the Republic of Poland. Um, we welcome uh, expert ladies who know everything about supporting and fostering innovation in, uh, among young people. Anna Gogolinska, who is the Deputy President uh, of Advanced Technology Foundation. Also, Barbara Halska, uh, who was the Teacher of the Year in 2014, who uh, works uh, uh, at uh, the Jan Trzeci Sobieski School. Uh, and she is um, she teaches uh, IT and uh, coding, and Anna Hroszczyka, who represents the Ministry of Education and Research. And uh, we also have Dr. Anna Stefan from the Ukrainian Institute uh, of uh, Scientific Research on Intellectual Property, and uh, she is uh, participating online. Uh, I uh, also invite you to, uh, to ask questions uh, in our chat app and we will try to address these um, at the end of uh, the panel discussion. So now we ask Ms. Anna Gogolinska from the Foundation of Advanced Technologies to take the floor. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jana Gogolinska. I represent the Foundation of Advanced Technologies, uh, which um, is in its 11th year of uh, implementing the Explory program. Uh, we support young, talented people and uh, um, uh, Explory also um, supports uh, activities of the uh, Polish Patent Office. We uh, want to safeguard uh, and foster the uh, intellectual property of our young beneficiaries. We want to protect their ideas. We have had some very uh, interesting presentations. Dr. Maciej Kawetski has uh, told us the stories of multiple um, examples of creativity and innovativeness in Poland, and uh, I'm certain that we will never be short of these because the experience of the Explory program uh, shows how many new and interesting ideas come from young people year by year. Uh, within Explory, we um, try to uh, fish out the young talents and then support them. Uh, how do we uh, go about finding them? How do we go about uh, supporting them? And what we can do to do this even better? Uh, this is what I will talk about. I will start from a short video clip. Mm, this is the Explory World, a young talent discovery program. We support them. Thanks to Explory, you can show your ideas and consult them with experts. You can win prizes and uh, receive help from mentors and financing uh, entities. And you can also participate in all kinds of uh, scientific workshops which will help develop your talents. 
And we are very happy that so many young people every year want to develop their scientific talents uh, every year. And here uh, in the presentation, it was said that we know everything about how to support innovation, foster innovation, but it turns out that we can still learn something new, and we find that out every year. Uh, and uh, this follows from our conversations, discussions with talents, uh, and we learn from their feedback what is effective and what is not. Um, Explory has to be as innovative as the talents we support. And the most important activity is the Explory contest uh, for original uh, Uh, concepts and inventions um, prepared by people aged between 13 and 20. That is very young people. Um, about 200 submissions uh, is uh, what comes year in, year out. This year it was uh, 240, which made us very happy. Uh, and what is very uh, salient is that uh, these young people, uh, from the moment they submit their project, uh, these people grow uh, as we watch them. Uh, so that is what we would like to happen. We want uh, the uh, people participating in the competition to develop, and we want to support their talents so they grow. Uh, so this is an ongoing work, a work in progress on uh, inventions and on the program at the same time. And what our participants underscore is that it is important for them um, to uh, tap the opportunity of talking to experts, to mentors, who will uh, help them understand where to look for further inspiration and how to develop their um, ideas. <clears throat> the contact with a business authority or a um, scientific authority This is their first encounter in their lives, and that is what we should uh, foster, and that is what is one of our foci. And the, um, these young people, the participants, have a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of competencies. Uh, they understand uh, interdisciplinary concepts, and uh, that is what uh, is provided by our mentors, our advisors. Um, we attach great weight to uh, making um, or setting the stage for the new inventions to be presented. And during the pandemic, uh, we had to go online. Um, but the aspect of showing, showcasing projects is so important. Um, learning how uh, the project should be uh, shown, how to make a pitch about uh, that project, and the ability to absorb our project uh, depends on that uh, to, uh, very heavily. Uh, so pitching our projects uh, on the web uh, is something that uh, helps uh, the uh, young people to gain new competencies on how to talk about what they do, and uh, they increase the, their range of impact. We have also been uh, building supportive programs over time because we think that these young people are still in need, always in need, uh, and um, some needs are unmet. And um, these people need to know how popular their ideas are, uh, and the contact with mentors is important. Uh, therefore, we um, place uh, Emphasis on um, uh, organizing meetings with alumni of previous programs. Uh, so our laureates, our finalists uh, of the Explory program, uh, are invited uh, to to meet the, the their younger peers, and this is a grant program for young talents. Uh, Uh, which uh, gives uh, young people the ability to finance their early research uh, for uh, for the sake of uh, developing their 
ideas, their inventions. So uh, the financing of a project or a prototype of the invention also teaches these young people how to manage a budget and how to um, uh, do fundraising, uh, which uh, needless to say is something that w will help them throughout their lives. Uh, it also uh, includes webinars and training sessions uh, given by experts, and also the aspect of uh, intellectual property protection is very important, and this is what uh, we are celebrating today, the IP Day, and we at Explory are also very keen on and making it known that the first public presentation of a scientific project and invention has to be well thought out uh, to what degree uh, it has to be decided to what degree the uh, project uh, will later possibly enjoy protection. And uh, together with Pat Paul, our colleagues uh, from this institution, we uh, try to teach these young people, these young talents, that what they are developing is their intellectual property, which they are entitled to. And uh, they uh, should be aware of how to uh, enforce that law, that right, sorry. And, uh, a significant uh, element uh, of support that we offer is uh, also assistance at the stage of uh, preparing um, a submission for, for a patent. Uh, and uh, quite a few of our um, alumni uh, successfully um, patented their inventions thanks to uh, patent attorney support. Uh, our activities also um, uh, are associated with festivals, with uh, um, showcasing science, and this um, makes people aware that innovation can happen anywhere and everywhere, that everybody can participate in uh, developing innovations or benefit from innovations, and therefore we uh, organize many events. Uh, we also have uh, um, created a, a series or helped create a series of uh, school explory competitions, regional festivals. For example, Gdynia Explory Week is an important um, event where we um, select winners of uh, the countrywide um, event or of the countrywide project. And we uh, think that this is. Uh, a job never done, we, we focus on that uh, very heavily. Uh, you may be interested to learn who these talents are, and does Explory have many of them. I want to present to you uh, several young people who are part of our Explory community and who have also benefited from all kinds of support. Uh, Nina Celica, uh, she was the winner of the Explory competition last year. Nina Celica is a great example f to support the notion that uh, young people find inspirations in any activity of daily living. She was looking at coffee and trying to understand what happens in the cup once we add milk. And this observation um, she was engrossed by this observation, and she ran a series of tests which allowed her to find an analogy uh, between uh, the mixing of uh, the com components of a coffee with milk, uh, and uh, she went on to uh, compare that to the physics of maelstroms and uh, then to uh, hurricanes and tornadoes. And such uh, projects uh, start from very mundane things. And Nina was the was this was her first time in the Explory uh, project and, and she won it right away. But she was also very active in uh, tapping our mentoring programs and therefore she was able to present her ideas in a perfect way. Daniel Czech and Mateusz Niedobecki. These two guys come from Rybnik. As you know, Rybnik is 
uh, uh, heavily polluted city. And uh, the community, including these young people, have to live with that. They understand that the quality of the, the air they breathe is bad. And the two boys uh, pre uh, developed a, a device which uh, cleans air uh, in a room. And um, this uh, project also gained uh, patenting support thanks to Explory and thanks to, to um, the, the legal office of, of uh, patent attorneys uh, and uh, I'm very happy that these guys uh, continue uh, to work uh, to develop their, their project and it's going to be commercialized. <clears throat> Another talent, Philippe Pienkosz. And uh, he uh, was a participant of one of the regional uh, stages of the Explory competition. This year, he developed a keyboard which can be programmed and can be used uh, by persons with various disabilities. This is a very interesting example of uh, <clears throat> how sensitive young people are. Uh, responding to all kinds of unmet needs um, in the community around them, for example, persons with disabilities. Uh, issues other people have are things they understand and recognize. And uh, Philip, Philip was also supported by Maciej Kawetsky, who uh, uh, is a participant in this uh, meeting and he supported uh, Philip uh, during an online pitching uh, session uh, where we asked these young people um, to present uh, their ideas uh, to the wide world and many people uh, showed interest in Philip's invention and they offered uh, all kinds of support. This is one of the uh, very important assets uh, that uh, the concept uh, provides or offers that the young talent, uh, in this case Philip, uh, can understand uh, that there is a broad uh, scope of possible development and uh, upgrades of, of certain ideas. Uh, we can also show you some talents who are uh, inspired by others. So we have uh, three Explory laureates uh, who uh, were listed by Forbes um, on, a, on a list of, of young talented per persons. Anna Skierska is a laureate. Uh, she um, ran uh, for the, uh, for, for the annual project three times, uh, she was uh, looking for uh, all kinds of resources that could be used uh, for building uh, economic efficient uh, solar panels. Yulia Kosinska uh, was uh, uh, studying how to uh, clean um, water bodies uh, from ibuprofen, which is also an important task. And Igor Kaczmarczyk um, uh, has uh, been known for uh, antibacterial activities of amber, known for studying they, these. And um, we have um, been able to uh, get scholarships uh, at the Weizmann Institute. He got that scholarship, he visited there, and he was very well accepted. And um, thanks to that, we try to uh, have such scholarships awarded for at least one of our laureates, one of our winners, every year. And I think that a growing number of um, Explory laureates, uh, young people from Poland, will gain recognition and we also um, expect commercialization of their inventions. Can we do more for talents in Poland? It should be said that um, there is uh, an um, enormous amount of talent in Poland. The first thing we should do is not harm them 
not hamper their activities, but uh, certainly we can do much more. This is a list of Explory partners. Those are companies, and we could even say a whole community of people who work in these companies who um, engage in the work of Explory. Uh, they support our activities financially. They also fund scholarships. Um, they also are interested in what else they can do, for example, internships, scholarships in their own companies or labs, or they can support um, the patenting process for these inventors. Uh, so that's what we um, learn from that, that a lot of uh, support is needed for the talents to flourish, and a lot can still be done. Uh, the goals of Explory, which I would like to make known to you and invite you to join us in uh, reaching these goals. Uh, for example, schools. Uh, schools house many talents. From Monday to Friday, they attend lessons, but they could also benefit uh, from developing of creativity, for example, by exploring festivals, and we urge schools to take up that challenge. The next uh, thing is the uh, growing or increasing uh, the number of uh, higher education um, opportunities uh, for these people who already at an early age uh, promote inventiveness, creativity. We want these people to study at our universities. There is a lot of work to do in that respect. And uh, at Explory, we think that we need to strongly emphasize that in any discussion uh, for these people to be able to select a university of their choice. In the United States, universities uh, compete for such creative young people, and we should bring about a similar scheme over here. Uh, I think there is a struggle for talent in, in Poland where companies um, compete with universities, um, but we should create joint programs rather than compete. Um, programs that would be focused on um, as a certain industries on, or industry branches uh, where uh, people who uh, have ideas, be they scientific or business uh, focused, uh, could find a place for themselves. So I uh, urge you to, to join us in our efforts and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Anna, for this very interesting presentation uh, showing us how pro-innovative activities addressed to young people are important. And we're very happy to learn that you don't uh, leave these people to their own devices, that uh, you um, facilitate meetings with uh, more experienced uh, researchers and business people, which is also needed to these for these young uh, inventors. And now Barbara Halska. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I thank you for the invitation to this event. Uh, this is very close to my heart because uh, I think that developing talent among uh, students is um, the most important thing. It's not uh, just uh, attending school, but um, the <clears throat> subjects, uh, school subjects uh, related to IT and coding uh, is something uh, that will uh, generate job opportunities for these young people. The, the labor market will require them or does require them. Um, uh, I can show you uh, several projects uh, uh, that were already <clears throat> drawn in by business. Uh, they also took part in Explory but did not win, which is not a bad turn uh, because these people learn, and that is something they will never lose. They learn how to present. Uh, and they also start to understand that not every jury has the same 
view or take uh, on the same invention or the same presentation. Therefore, these young people need to understand that it's uh, good for them to participate in as many competitions as they can because that develops their competencies. Here, I don't want to brag, but um, uh, I want to uh, relate to, to our conference which discusses IP. And here we have a list of locations where we participated in uh, innovation competitions. And uh, whenever we submit such a project at such competitions, one of the important aspects is uh, checking whether the project has been submitted for uh, patent protection, and uh, that is not only national patenting but also international patenting, like the European uh, patent or Asian patent. This is one of uh, the important points or, or items. And the next is um, uh, answering the question, is this uh, proje project amenable to commercialization, to implementation? Uh, and uh, these uh, projects can then win gold medals at these competitions, which is very important for these young uh, people. And. Uh, um, uh, taking part in, in some ranking lists uh, is also uh, very developmental for these people because they pitch in English. They have to learn better English than they frequently uh, have acquired at school. And this is possibly uh, a much better verification than passing an oral exam in a foreign language at school. We have uh, visited Asia multiple times, and what happens over there is just wonderful, is amazing, because uh, children already in primary school start their innovative paths, uh, career paths. So from the first grade, of course, they are not able to do all of it on their own. They need assistance from their teachers, but they have the possibility, the opportunity to present themselves. And going uh, among the stands, uh, I can show you, I can tell you that the younger the kid was, the better they were prepared. The pitch, the presentation, the way the, the, the kid was, uh, well, looked or came across. Um, the projects were sometimes very, very simple, but uh, this is uh, not not a, 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 the only criterion that should be applied. And I think Explory should uh, change their rules uh, and admit people under 13. Also in Asia, uh, the Ministry of Education of a given country uh, creates a very celebratory atmosphere around these uh, project presentations and the children feel that this is something great in their lives and that is what we should do we should promote the fact that these kids are doing nice interesting things and uh, Another thing I, I take from Asia is that every school can submit one project coming from that school, uh, receiving sponsoring from the state to present that project at an international event. I think this can also support these young people. We have been participating in the competitions which are listed here thanks to partnerships with uh, the world of business. So the business people were the uh, sponsors here. And the partnership, I come from Jastrzębie Zrój, uh, which uh, does uh, uh, not have uh, a railway connection. So to get to Warsaw, I had to go to another city to get on a train. In Yastrzębie, you may have heard we have a difficult situation uh, due to uh, the uh, disasters, the mining disasters that have happened, and we're praying now for the people who did not return. Um, um, well, we uh, apart from uh, our um, copper mining uh, industry, uh, this uh, company that uh, we're talking about now, the Yastrzębie Coal Mining Company, is uh, very innovative. So this is, was one of the issues, and this is uh, an, an issue of. Um, 
uh, switches, um, which uh, created some issues uh, for um, the uh, trains. So, so th these were these were the switches that uh, that were to. Uh, Provide a more streamlined work of the of the uh, railways of the coal mines, and so this was our, one of our projects. Um, it was a preparation for the baccalaureate uh, and uh, preparing um, for all kinds of innovative activities. We prepared our own platform. Um, when we say we, I, I mean the students uh, who um, worked on the project uh, for two years. And uh, here's the game. I, I I brought an example, but Dr. Kavetsky was the first to grab it. Um, so. Um, this game was also developed at Explory. It was the first ignition point where young people who are interested in astronomy said that there are there is no board game uh, that would be interesting and uh, deal with uh, issues of astronomy. So the game evolved, and also thanks to uh, business, uh, thanks to the Orange Foundation, we were able to uh, commercialize, to publish uh, this uh, game, and uh, these young people are now selling that, and uh, these young people have went on to undertake studies at our Polish uh, universities. Uh, this game uh, was also uh, played by by the ambassador of Taiwan, so we're very happy about that. Uh, and uh, I would also like to pr show you projects which were not devised per se uh, for the award in a competition, uh, but they were developed uh, in order to uh, positively impact the functioning of a city uh, or of uh, business. And uh, we um, developed uh, a platform, an online platform, uh, which um, is to help young people select a career path. Uh, so we start by uh, posing questions to a 14-year-old. Um, and these questions profile the type of personality of the person, of the, of the responder. This is... Um, um, a tool that has been working or operational for two years, and we verified what this uh, system um, told them. Um, I um, noticed or, or found that the, the, it has a 75% precision. Uh, actually, um, I, when I took the test, even though I'm an IT specialist, I, uh, I w was uh, termed entrepreneur, entrepreneurial by this uh, system. Uh, but um, what we uh, have thought about is to facilitate um, uh, the decision-making process, which is very difficult for young people, uh, so that they can uh, select a career path uh, that will be satisfactory for them. What, uh, what has to be done for these young people uh, to actually go for it? We have to organize hackathons. And uh, I now turn to uh, the business world. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, to sponsor hackathons for very young people. Their heads are not yet formatted. Um, they don't yet know that certain things can't be done. We know they can't be done, but it is for them to find it out for themselves. Don't tell them this can't be done, because hackathons can single out projects which can later be uh, submitted, for example, to, the, to an exploratory program. Another project, hopefully it will uh, gain business support, an app, which was developed at the stage of uh, the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, an app uh, to uh, order food, uh, and the project uh, has already uh, evolved, and uh, it, the next stage is the development uh, of a meal dispenser where the meals will be deep 
deposited and, and the uh, customer will come and pick them up. Um, and um, uh, what we need to do is help these people in, a, in assessing what their early idea is uh, in terms of its strengths and weaknesses, and Explory is something that works that way. The jury is always uh, composed of at least two people. One of them is a scientist, the other is a business person, and the business uh, side uh, has a different view, and the scientist side has a different view uh, of these projects and those are the partners with whom we are able to uh, make this happen and as regards uh, competitions or projects there are so many of them uh, and I would love to see them uh, promoted uh, for young people to understand that there are opportunities out there for schools to understand that they are there uh, so, um, so as schools can uh, actually gain good points uh, on ranking lists uh, that way. Uh, I, I really am attached to the ones that I'm showing here, uh, but they uh, all serve to develop uh, young people. Uh, there is a project by Samsung where people uh, go through the whole project. Uh, and Intel, here is another uh, step in the direction of AI, something the world needs, and um, a center of informatic championship or IT championship. Uh, I have dressed up uh, in uh, an IT pattern uh, only if we um, uh, do, do it the right way, uh, we can gain uh, patent protection. and. This can follow uh, the Explory scenario even further on, go further on, because anybody can present any idea there, and they always have mentorship available. We can uh, turn to people who, on a daily basis, look at interesting solutions. They work in business, but they also want to lend a hand to these young people. And here, calling on Ribnik, who was already mentioned, uh, there is a project uh, on uh, uh, greening up uh, landfills uh, created by la by coal mines, um, and uh, this is a very interesting stage uh, before the finals. What else? We we're talking about games. Let's uh, <clears throat> take on a game jam. Let's also do that with uh, the business community because the business community is able to single out. Um, uh, gaming uh, inventions uh, which are amenable to commercialization, but let's also do it with the scientists because they can single out what can be the subject for further for further research and study. I hope I haven't bored you. If anybody is interested in learning more about these projects, you have my email address here, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we've learned how young people can participate in innovation projects, what competitions they can participate in. we also very glad that in these activities, also international, you don't forget IP, whether intellectual or uh, industrial property, because this also teaches innovation and it shows that you need to make sure that your concept, your idea is cherished. May I now ask Anna Hrościcka from the Ministry of Education and Science to take the floor. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Our cooperation between the Ministry of Education and the Patent Office is vibrant, developing more and more, and gives this gives me a great satisfaction. May I tell you something about two projects? The first was um, <clears throat> inspired by the EUIPO. In 2016, EUIPO decided to fill in a certain gap. The gap that has been discussed extensively by my two colleagues there are plenty of highly talented and highly innovative young people in schools. We wanted to show them that patent, that intellectual property, 
is also there to protect their skills, their entrepreneurship, their innovative spirit. This project is primarily focused on searching for good practices, for the tools, for the uh, various parts of different uh, systems of education to teach children how to use IP for their own purpose and how to and also to teach teachers what intellectual property is. This project will transform into a certain network of contact, contacts. We cooperate here at the level of the Ministry and Patent Office with organizations gathering teachers, with teachers. Perhaps I'll move to the next point. I participate in this project with Marek Gozdera, who introduced the previous panel, the previous session. This is a link to this project and to all the information about it, who represents what state, who participates in the project. It is very interesting. I've had an opportunity to work with a number of people, and there were plenty of very attractive materials. Some of them were really simple as you can imagine, just course books. Things to read, also electronically, to very complex projects that also made use of educational games. So gamification. Another project is our project, I mean domestic ones, developed in the Ministry of Education and Science, an integrated educational platform ZPE. Launched in 2019, it answered a certain need for how to address it, bringing together teaching aids, taking a certain step towards digitalization of schools. We decided to set up a platform with e-books, e-course books, various teaching aids. It's a tool for distance education, making use of an array of options. This platform is being developed. We're making use of EU funds. And now the platform boasts several thousand of different items, course books, um, interactive educational aids. They all are not only for the general stream of education, they're also for the educational in professional subjects. They are free of charge accessible 24-7. These resources can be used by people with disabilities and, important from the point of view of intellectual property, they are available um, because they are licensed uh, on the power of Creative Commons licenses. So you can use them to develop your CC protected um, resources and you can create any tools you want for the uh, development of the new projects that would be best fit to the given group of students and to the subject that the teacher would like to present. That's a link to IP. There's information about copyright, about patenting. Those elements are present on our platform in various forms. This is mostly IT, but also music and copyrights that are connected to various creative pursuits. This is our website. That's a screenshot. 
You can use this platform using a mobile um, app. At the moment, it's only available for Android. But this year, we're also going to develop it for iOS. It's important that you can log into the platform, but you don't have to. You can use all the educational content without logging in. It also provides a tool for distance learning. It's integrated with the most popular video communication tools. And it's all available from the level of the platform. These are our platform plans for 2022. We want to help and to insight to the development of your own materials. We mean here our conversion from PDF to our formats that letters uh, develop co-production, co-working, co-development, so that students could use it for the development of their creative tools, and also creation with the resources of libraries and museums. These were the statistics in the last year. These are high numbers. I'm not going to bore you to death with those. And to wrap up my presentation, I'd like to tell you that Yes, we understand it. We're very glad to have such innovative students and teachers. And we're trying to support their creativity on various fields. Thank you very much for that address. As we could see, the platform is really rich. Yesterday I had an opportunity to visit and to check. There are plenty of subjects touched. And there are plentiful resources, which shows that in the case of the new media, there is no subject that wouldn't use them. Especially in the pandemic, we had an opportunity to test those. You can really even teach physical education online. That's also possible. Once again, thank you. And now let's try to connect to Ukraine. We've got Dr. Anna Stefan from the Ukrainian Institute for Researching Intellectual Property. Let's now make use of our uh, interpreting aids. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Can you, I ask you to have my presentation on the screen? Yes, we do have the presentation. It's going to be here with us in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. My dear colleagues, it's a great satisfaction for me to be able to listen to all those presentations. We find them very precious here in Ukraine. The Polish experience here is very interesting, and I am convinced that all the good practices, all the best practices will be used in our country. I wanted to share some information with you how Ukraine supports young people and their creativity. Also, how we can improve this process. The slides you can see are in Ukrainian and Polish. The Polish translation was made by Google. I hope that the mistakes are not that numerous. First, I let myself emphasize why, the reasons why it's so important that Ukraine is interested in supporting creativity of young people. Not only the inventors and the creators, but also the state should be interested in that. Last year, we approved the national strategy. One of its goals, one of its purposes is developing a competitive and innovative economy. Prior to that, we 
approved a list of various areas which are counted among creative and innovative. There are 43 such items. We also concluded and decided that we would define which sectors find innovation most important, for which sectors innovation is key. We also investigated how the creative industries, creative sectors develop and how this can influence the economy of Ukraine and also the labor market, competitive edge in the international markets as well. That's why the Ukrainian state is keen on developing these sectors in the future. We all understand that this is founded on the creative individuals who simply generate ideas, inventions, and the young are the future of that creative sector. That is why the state should be interested not only with the developing creativity as such, and creative industries, of course, but also in providing opportunities to young people to be able to carry out their creative ideas, to follow their pursuits. Back in 2014, a special act was passed to support young people not only in their creativity. Certain tasks were uh, given so that young people could um, be creative and could develop their creativity. That act is still in force. Some initiatives that may be 10 or 20 year old are still developing, are being complemented, even at the level of legislation. Ukraine demonstrates its desire to provide conditions for creative development to young people. For that reason, we organize competitions at national level. Some of them organize with the aid of the state to encourage young people, people under 35, to be creative. There are grants from the President of the Republic. These grants are awarded for specific projects. There is a call for proposals. Proposals with their cost estimates are submitted and special committees sit on them. And the winners of the competitions gain funds for um, carrying them out. The amount of money awarded is not made public because the pricing, the valuation of individual projects varies. Let me share with you information about one of those grants. Margaret of Zhornov, the winner of the grant, had the idea to create an art book about some convictions that are based on fairy tales, on some ethnographic narratives about the mythologi mythological creatures. She wrote short stories. I hope you can see my slide now, because my slide now has illustrations from her works. She developed her own um, graphic images, and what she did is quite differentiated. Some of the winners of those competitions are young. The average age is 25, however, so we can say that these are mature people who are the winners. We also organize a special premier in the office of the minister and invite about 20 winners. Each of them is granted about 1,600 euro. For our conditions, it's a decent amount, a decent prize. 
many people who win these prizes are students. However, we set a cap on the age. These people cannot be over 35. In each um, region, in each county, we also have the mayor's um, prizes. This is an example of the prize of the mayor of Kiev. Uh, such a prize was set up by the mayor of Kiev. Creativity also means artistic creation. Therefore, such competitions can be won by artists. For young authors, but ones of particular renown, there is some additional prize for continuation of their artistic endeavors. For example, in Kyiv, most winners of such competitions are university or high school students. In Kyiv, this is focused far more on the young people. We also have in Ukraine a plethora of other competitions carried out by international organizations. Here we encourage young people to be creative. Those organizations also offer grants. Information about those is available, and probably Poland and other member states of the EU know of these projects. And we also luckily have those projects developing in Ukraine. We have our own projects. A good idea are Ukraine Smart Awards. It's something rather for the inventors, but you need to be innovative to, to work on that. The nominations are plentiful. For example, improving the ecology of some resource. You can also uh, opt for business solutions. We have plenty of uh, participants among the young people and among students. This year, we had a competition. Well, we also accounted for the results obtained in 2021, but uh, the prizes were presented already after the invasion in April. That's a very positive aspect that even in those difficult conditions that we suffer from now, we see and we show the support for such uh, forms of activity. I wanted to count the number of the enterprise that are there to support creativity. And the task is very difficult because we haven't got such information. Only in the Kyiv region, we have around 250 competitions and other initiatives that can involve younger people who can exchange information and ideas. On the other hand, we have the example coming from the uh, Lviv region, where 150 such projects are run. Such initiatives are plentiful in all throughout the country, but the largest numbers of young inventors are in the Lviv and Ukraine and Kyiv area. What else could Ukraine do to support the innovation of the young people? I believe it is most important to have a general portal with information about all the competitions and programs for the creative young people carried out in Ukraine, because uh, if it is impossible to find all that information in one place, makes the life of young people difficult. They uh, should have some assistance in finding those. Now you need to look separately from all the institutions. If those were gathered in a single place, 
If you had such a one-stop shop, it would help in communication. Now, the second point is the education for the creative uh, branches. Like in many other parts of the world, we focus here on the educational processes. All these sectors develop so dynamically that it would be hard to share information, sh share examples that were developed a decade ago. For this reason, universities use the most classical examples, the most classical experiences. And yet we have plentiful initiatives that tell us how we can adjust that to the our current demand to the developed initiative. How to adapt because the creative resources used by creators, whether architects, jewelers or other, do not have to be adjusted to reality. With that base, they still have to master the current knowledge, and Ukrainian universities do not always share that. The third point is the operation of the state institutions working on creative projects and turning them into business cooperation with state institutions? Well, there are times when this comes hard. There are plentiful uh, bureaucratic obstacles against it. Too many documents required, time for submitting documentation. We must work towards simplification here. And the state should develop conditions so that all the creative initiatives could be developed here. But the state should not interfere and simplify to the max all the formalities that are required here. We also need to streamline the legislation. 1990s, the 1990s were the time of reform of the sector. Later, all those acts were amended, some aspects were improved. However, we know that they were taken over with the view of the world that existed 25 years ago or more, a reality that has long been the past. That's why these have to be adapted to the current needs. The world is changing dynamically, and the acts lag behind the, the developments. We need to exchange experience and give more than just an opportunity to participate in competitions all around the world. This is primarily an opportunity to find your place, to exchange ideas, to generate ideas and to uh, develop new projects. That would be very good for the Ukrainian creative youth. Obviously, in 2020, our 2022, our mm, situation changed. All the projects are now uh, stalled because the priority of the state is to win this war. However, we begin that this victory will draws near and we will be able to return to all our priorities and carry out those plans that we've got and we'll be able to develop this. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong slide, my mistake. I just wanted to thank you for your attention, for the option to address you, and for being here with you. Thank you very much. We're so impressed with this lavish range of the activities that Ukraine conducts, both public institutions and the individual cities. And we believe that still, uh, you will be able to return to those innovation supporting activities throughout Ukraine. Thank you once again for this address. I believe that we have finished our rounds of presentations. Do we have any questions in the chat, perhaps, from the people who watch us, who listen to us, who are here with us? We don't have any questions, so may I invite you to a short break. And after the break, we will follow into another panel on the game dev sector and its challenges in the protection of IP. 
Ladies, thank you for participation. Thank you, Anna. And, well, let's meet in 15 minutes. Thank you.
ale to utwór zawierający wizualizację różnych postaci, przedmiotów. It is a, um, muzykę, creation which shows characters, sceneries, but also the screenplay. Uh, sometimes we may have noticed that uh, a vehicle uh, we see in the game uh, can be identical or very like uh, a real a vehicle. We have uh, uh, seen, for example, logos uh, that we know from real products, <laughs> not uh, to mention faces of musicians or athletes that we love. Uh, all of these um, trademarks uh, and uh, individual traits uh, should be protected and hopefully uh, we are going to uh, hear from our uh, panelists um, what they think about how they should be protected. We have with us Dr. Marcin Balicki, an attorney, Piotr Mierzwiński, who is a patent attorney, uh, Ms. Anna Palinska from CD Project Red, uh, and uh, Marta Stormowa from Nasus Vincere, and RP. Anna Dachowska, uh, a director at the Polish Patent Office. Now, thank you for joining today. And now I will give the floor to Dr. Marcin Balicki, the first of our guests, who will discuss what uh, legal challenges lie ahead uh, when uh, trademarks are used uh, in the sets uh, or used by game developers. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the organization of this conference and uh, the invitation there too. I think that uh, uh, on the IP Day, World IP Day, I think uh, video games are a very uh, pertinent subjects. Uh, um, video game uh, is a collection of uh, intellectual property. Um, there is no problem if all the uh, intellectual property belongs to the developer, uh, but what if the developer wants or has to use um, additional uh, items or objects uh, that are protected by others, uh, copyright or intellectual property, uh, with or without asking them for permission? And that is our discussion about uh, trademarks, um, which uh, we can find in games. Why is this uh, pertinent in our discussion of legal challenges? Uh, until recently, uh, create the creation of a scenery, a set, uh, that uh, was very <coughs> alike uh, or like what we know from reality um, until recently was very difficult. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot from a 1996 game. Um, the view of Los Angeles is somewhat uh, substandard, but here in 2013 we also see uh, Los Angeles, but in a way that is photorealistic. Uh, down below, we can see an even newer game coming from a Polish studio, and this is part of the map uh, of uh, the action taking place in Warsaw. So if we uh, take into account <coughs> that uh, previously uh, the sets <coughs> created by developers uh, were uh, rather symbolic, <clears throat> and today this has changed, then we come up with a new challenge. Uh, is this something uh, and that we should and how should we address it legally? Today we already have these challenges at hand, and here we see um, at least partly a uh, Warsaw scenery in this last game. Um, we see streets and um, uh, 
shopping center, which is not uh, called Golden Terraces, but uh, uh, yellow, uh, well, paths maybe. Uh, um, and uh, let's address the question whether the change of the name was actually needed um, in uh, the process of uh, publishing the game. And then we can move on to uh, other issues. Um, on the left-hand side, we see Duke Nukem 3D uh, of 1996. Uh, there was a rather symbolic rendering of uh, LA, uh, but strip bars uh, were an element. Um, and uh, here, the use of trademarks will uh, come back with a vengeance, and the next issues is the use of weapons. All three elements you see here um, are um, related to shootouts, uh, shooting uh, either humans or aliens. And um, there are also other ways of applying trademarks, uh, creating fictitious trademarks, which exist only in the world of the game. For example, Nuka Cola sometimes become rather popular. Another strategy is uh, a parodistic presentation of uh, known realist, real trademarks. Grand Theft Auto is one of those. Here you see uh, some brands that are uh, already uh, well known, which uh, are parodistically changed in uh, the games. This carries uh, some legal risk, some jeopardy. Uh, of various uh, scope, um, but uh, not every title will uh, justify uh, a jocular take uh, on reality. As regards real brands, real trademarks, um, there are two ways of using them, either as a promotional element or as an element of the scenery, the set. And so uh, the promotion of uh, uh, the brand or the game is uh, exclusively exercised uh, uh, based on uh, the uh, consent of the patentee uh, or the owner uh, of the intellectual property. Here in Need for Speed, we uh, have Porsche cars, uh, but in Drift 21, which you see in the upper left-hand corner, no brand is uh, highlighted more than others. We see a BMW and a Mazda here. And we have lost the sound of the speaker. And the sound is back. Is without uh, a prominent uh, singling out of any of these brands. The use of um, brand names and uh, trademarks um, um, based on uh, contracts uh, does not uh, lead to any risks uh, or of uh, impinging on on uh, the exclusive rights uh, of their holder uh, but other risks may emerge for example uh, presenting tobacco brands would not be uh, allowed by other regulations. Uh, sometimes we want uh, to or we consider the application of trademarks um, at the level of the set or scenery, uh, but we do not ask for permission. What we see here is um, uh, part of uh, a racing circuit uh, with uh, uh, a visible uh, Virac trademark. Um, the owner of that trademark <coughs> uh, 
contended that, took the case to court. Uh, the case was finally won by the uh, developer of the game, uh, where it was stated that uh, this is only used by way of decoration. But if we l look at a game as a, an entire product, and then depending on how the trademark will be applied, uh, this leads to the need uh, to acquire consent or not. Um, the next question, do we use a trademark at all? If we do, uh, does this use, this application, um, infringe any functions uh, used by this trademark, especially the, the derivation uh, which is being denoted. Uh, jurisprudence would be a good source of information. <clears throat> However, not enough jurisprudence has yet been produced. Uh, there is uh, another question. Um, how is um, or for what ends is the trademark being used in <clears throat> the scenery of the game? Uh, does it relate to the actual uh, vehicle, for example, that is shown <clears throat> in that, or is it related to some virtual uh, element? Uh, depending on the metaverse that we use, uh, we will have a different approach to assessing the trademark. For example, if the trademark of a car is also registered for video games, at the same time, the trademark <coughs> will be used in a racing game, and it was used uh, for the video game, then a dual identity uh, will find use in that case. The use of, uh, or perhaps there, there, there is a, a risk uh, of uh, causing error in understanding or in, in the reception of these trademarks. <coughs> Uh, products which have uh, specific trademarks and specific protection regulations uh, may lead to asking further questions. If a trademark um, of, for example, a car is used in a video game, <clears throat> may lead to contention. For example, there is an, uh, a case uh, where decorations, uh, decorational use of trademarks related to models uh, of cars. Um, the owner of the Opal trademark uh, took the case to court uh, because the game featured a car where the trademark, the brand of the Opal, which was uh, placed on, on this toy, um, the court case uh, led to a final decision that this was not an infringement. <clears throat> it turned out in the end that the Opal trademark was also protected for its application in toys. Uh, then. Uh, since Opal is the owner of uh, the trademark both for the toy and for the real car. Uh, and uh, the company of the manufacturer does not use the Opal trademark on uh, the packaging but on the model itself. Um, uh, 
there is uh, there are more issues because uh, a given video game can be sold on various markets where both the regulations and the jurisprudence can differ in the United States a certain line of jurisprudence has already started to emerge and the European situation is different because we have not yet had a such uh, court rulings so if we use a mm, uh, hundred uh, trademarks on a hundred markets, then potentially this can generate 10,000 contentious cases. Uh, and uh, 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 of course, uh, this is not always the same level of risk, but a level of complication or complexity may be added by developers and publishers of video games. In the issue of car models, one of the arguments uh, of the court ruling which uh, uh, and in which the case ended is that there is a long-standing tradition of uh, manufacturing real cars with the appropriate markings and the consumers, however, understand that uh, um, trademark applied on a toy does not necessarily imply in the eyes of the consumer that this has been licensed by the owner of the trademark. For video games, this is not a uh, given because uh, there are varied practices of the developers themselves. Since plus minus 2013, uh, military game uh, manufacturers, developers have, have decided to stop licensing um, weaponry uh, they, they show. Uh, after one of the shootouts in an American school uh, where it, the issue was raised that there is too much uh, connection between developers and uh, the manufacturers of weapons. They pounced on the idea and electronic arts, one of the larger manufacturers, the book does not ask for permission uh, whether it can use uh, the word or the marking cult. Uh, this could be agreed upon or with, but uh, if not for the fact that EA earlier applied for such licenses. Uh, most of the cases that were lodged uh, did not end in rulings, but they illustrate the issues that may emerge when video games feature trademarks. Uh, there were uh, several cases. Um, there was uh, the case uh, that uh, one of the Wild West games used uh, the word and the trademark Pinkerton, even though the current uh, trademark uh, of Pinkerton is completely different compared to the early one or to the first edition. The uh, contention ended quite quickly. No ruling was issued by the court. But um, one of the issues was that uh, uh, the Pinkerton agency was portrayed as uh, one um, featuring evil uh, officers. Um, Another case uh, of uh, a trademark in a video game was related to a strip club. This was an interesting um, court case because it led to the issuing of a final judgment in the favor of the manufacturer of the game. The trademark was used in not, not in the original format. It was uh, uh, used as in, in a parodistic way. Playpen was renamed to Pigpen. 
Um, but the court pointed out that relating to the club itself was related to the artistic aim of the game developers. And the look and feel of Eastern LA was uh, part of that. Uh, w one of the hallmarks of that look and feel are strip bars. And uh, also the court stated that uh, no connections uh, could be construed or implied between the developer and the operator of the club, that the uh, club owner or operator sponsored the game in any way. It was one of the elements that were available or accessible to the gamer, but it was not an element that was um, um, clearly necessary for playing the game. Perhaps the case would be different if the game involved managing of such a strip joint. Um, another issue was that not that the part of the city was uh, reflected in a one-to-one -one fashion, um, but it was reconstructed in a slightly symbolic way, and the whole quarter or block does not have to be reconstructed to show all the companies and trademarks and notices that are um, visible on the walls. So the gaming developer, the game developer does not have to go all the way. But this doesn't always go the same way. Uh, the manufacturer of uh, um, football team management simulator uh, here, the use of uh, the Bundesliga Coach Association uh, went a bit too far. Not only the name, but also the logo of the organization was displayed in the game and on its packaging. Uh, the military issues I mentioned before and EA mm, games uh, stopped licensing uh, weapons. Um, EA was um, uh, called to court by Bell Helicopters. Bell Helicopters uh, is the owner of uh, certain names and trademarks of um, several of its products, several helicopters. They were used in by EA. Um, the contention ended in an out-of-court settlement, but based on uh, some enunciations of the court, we can draw the lesson that if we are to use such trademarks, they should not relate to some key uh, functions of the game. Uh, one of the allegations of Bell Helicopters uh, was related to um, um, the claim that uh, the use of these hel helicopter renderings was a very important hallmark of the game. And then w this went on into um, Activision Blizzard games, which was not related to helicopters but to Humvee vehicles. In the game, these Humvees were uh, exploited uh, quite heavily, uh, although this was justified by the game itself. Uh, the series of games in the majority of cases relates to quite current uh, conflicts where Humvees are actually uh, deployed. Um, and th that deployment was part of the game or element of, an element of the game, although not, not a key one. Uh, the uh, court ruling was in favor of the game developer. It was stated that uh, there is a justified artistic goal to render uh, in a credible way um, 
uh, modern battlefield, and the war theater in modern times features such vehicles heavily. In that case, uh, there is no risk of misleading the uh, public or the user because uh, uh, on the one hand, hum Humvees, on the, other on the other hand, the games are addressed to completely different uh, audiences. And how does that carry over into uh, what we see in the games? In the upper right hand, we uh, see the licensed version of the car, while on the right hand, lower um, panel, we see a car that looks very much like the previous one, but is not licensed. Um, there are relatively uh, few um, court rulings in Europe or any other uh, legal opinions or assessments that would give us uh, some or inform our assessment of these issues. <clears throat> but uh, similar factors play a role um, both on the um, American and EU market. And there are some um, data to support this notion uh, where uh, trademarks are evaluated differently depending on whether they are a key element of the game, uh, one that promotes the game or not. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. You have reminded me of my youth and I understood that the realism you mentioned uh, made games so very um, attractive, <clears throat> where in one of the games you mentioned you not only could drive a supercar, but you could even tune it. And now I would like to ask uh, Councillor Piotr Mierzyński, who will uh, search for the answer to the following question. Can we have an invention in a game? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my great pleasure to participate in the event. I'm not a scientist. I'm a patent attorney, and I'd like to discuss the problems connected to the protection of computer games from the perspective of a patent attorney. Let me start from the legal grounds for protection of intellectual property. There are three pillars. First, fighting unfair competitors, protection of the creative elements, copyright, and protection of the assets of industrial uh, property. These are the three pillars on which the protection is based, especially in the case of those complex products such as computer games, video games. Video game is a particular combination of software user interface. This work combines audio and visual elements, music, literary works. Sometimes you also need special hardware to be able to make use of such a creative work. What can be protected in a video game? Audio elements, compositions, sound bites, voice, animations, texts, and of course, the code. All these taken together make up a video game, which is a single product that provides entertainment to its user. What I would, however, want to emphasize is that these all must be somehow connected in a manner different than in other creative sectors, because that calls for a technological layer and also creative artistic expression. The computer code transforms ideas into lavish examples of visual art that come alive on smartphones, PCs, Macs, and all the other uh, devices. 
new membership. Those compilations are protected by uh, copyright, and I'm not going to discuss it here. Let's remember that visual elements and elements of music may be protected as works, but can also be registered as trademarks. Trademarks were already mentioned by the previous speaker. The uh, appearances of video games, uh, figures, characters can be uh, recorded as industrial design. So can be some elements of the interface. However, these are all su uh, subjects of protection that I'm not going to discuss today. What I'm most keen to discuss with you today are patterns. Copyright is mostly protection for the source code and for the individual works that this big one consists of. In IP protection, this can be uh, trademarks, but also industrial design, as well as technical solutions, not only computer-aided inventions, but also the devices necessary to play, controllers, displays, and VR, AR goggles. Now, can we patent anything in the games? Well, not really in the game. When a client comes with a concept, an idea, they have a great computer game and have a great idea, the first disillusion comes with the answer that, sorry, no idea can be protected, be it IP law, be it uh, copyright. There is a similar exclusion in both cases that Proviso won't let you protect the methods of playing, the principles. There are uh, appropriate exclusions for those. In the case of computer games, obtaining a patent can be a challenge because, by definition, these are excluded from patenting and certain elements of the game can be are protected and let me give you a very interesting example in the further part of the game. Well, the actual legal reasons are that patents are provided for solutions independent of the uh, field of technique. They must be new, they must have inventive step and must be industrially applicable. Apart from the mathematical formula and also computer software per se. Per se is the keyword here which opens certain paths to obtaining certain forms of protection. However, that is a path riddled with difficulties. In the recent years, we've seen plenty of patent applications for digital communication and also for solutions concerning computer technology. Nevertheless, they all have a common denominator, which is a technical nature, a technical character, you could say. Um, basically, technology are methods of making impact on matter, whether animate or not, and satisfy some practical human needs. The question is whether computer games satisfy any human needs. If it is sellable, marketable, it satisfies some needs. However, the technical character is an obstacle of a higher level as it often uh, makes software not legible for that form of support. Now, some statistics on uh, patent applications at the EU Patent Office on computer solutions we see a growth by nearly 10%. So the area connected to inventions concerning digital and computer solutions is developing, is on the rise. However, to find some solutions concerning games here, you need to make an effort because these are true mostly for devices helping you to play the game, consoles, controllers, such devices are absolutely protectable, unlike the other aspects of the game. These aspects, however, are also protectable. 
if you can't obtain patent protection, certain games aspects can still be protected as industrial design, as trademark, and of course, through copyright as multimedia works, computer software, or some specific elements connected to the uh, databases necessary for playing such games. And attractive challenge is the use of AI. It's a challenge for the whole sector, as AI will certainly make its mark on the development of the players' um, sensations during the game. However, that is quite costly and also causes a lot of trouble when looking industrial property protection. What is protectable in your game? I've mentioned those. These can be graphic elements, but these can also be other elements, scenario, plot, and other literary forms, figures, map, also the architecture present in the uh, game world. Uh, of course, if they meet the provisions necessary to call them works. A game is a multimedia work which brings together aspects of new typical um, works with an element of interactivity and non-linear access to the content and competition or cooperation or cooperation of the users. This causes plenty of problems. We've already mentioned such issues as so-called shooters and which also have a whole community developed around them, and sometimes even the business known as e-sport. It's quite controversial whether you can actually call it a sport or not, but this is a big and very vibrant market, something worth attention. To wrap up, what is protectable in a computer game? And how? Well, you can exercise copyright for some elements of the game, and patents, well, primarily for the technical solutions necessary for uh, the game controllers, and optionally also various algorithms specific for a given technical solution. So you can point to a technical nature of a solution, and then you can apply for the protection of such an element, such a part of the game. Now, a handful of examples, my favorite ones, when controllers are meant, is an example that's several years old now, Dice Plus. Unfortunately, those dices as product never found their niche in the market. However, what's valuable in this example is that this is something that can acquire protection through patenting. We see it's an electronic device. It has this technical character that was assumed to streamline playing on your tablet, on your smartphone. Another interesting aspect is that the uh, inventors come from Poland. Another example I'd like to share with you is quite controversial because this is a video game medium for uh, showing where the player is during the game, so a guide mark. The whole is based on what you see on the screen during the gameplay. Obviously, this example comes from a game that is typical of uh, controlling many players at the same time, for example, football. And to be able to control those, you must know where your footballers are. And the solution that finally received um, protection after arbitration points the placement, the situation of individual players during the gameplay. Of key importance here was whether their placement uh, 
is um, caused by the rules of the game, which uh, by law are excluded from patent protection, or is it a technical solution, which therefore allows extending patent protection to it? I do encourage you to read the uh, description of those and also the decision of the appeal. To wrap up my presentation, I'd like to mention that uh, industrial property right is limited in protecting video games. Primarily, you can protect in this way industrial design. You can protect those with industrial design and with trademarks. Patents can be used for uh, VR goggles, AR goggles, consoles, controllers, and such equipment. It's very rare that you can patent computer-aided invention. Obviously, let me pose the question, to what degree do we need specific forms of protection for computer games? I am quite convinced that at the moment you don't need those. On the other hand, I can't rule out such a necessity in the future. And I believe that this is where I should end. Thank you very much for your attention, and I do encourage you to ask questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. By now, we already know that computer software has not be uh, patented as such, as it has no technical nature. However, we'd like to thank you for showing us this array of ways how certain elements of a game can be protected. Also, as um, intellectual property, may I now invite Kinga Palinska, who will tell us about her experience connected to this hiatus between the binding law and the market practice in the game sector. We'll have Kinga with us online. Good afternoon. Can you see my presentation, please? We can hear you. Can you see? Yes, you can. Yes, we can see your presentation now. All right. Thank you very much for this invitation and for the opportunity to meet you. As an aficionado of live uh, meetings, I'm so sorry I can't meet you in the uh, building of the Polish Patent Office. Now, may I provoke you for a moment? Before, however, I do it, I'd like to start our meeting from celebrating a certain success. Before, we've heard some nice words about the game dev sector. It's big, it's important. In Poland, it's one of the most recognizable Polish economy branches, and we are learning about it whenever we go abroad. Strangely, few people in Poland realize how very much foreigners um, covet uh, that, and they really envy us, this sector. The Polish Agency for Development of Entrepreneur, one of the Polish foundations, and the ministry developed a report that uh, says that we have 470 game devs, and the total game dev employment exceeds 12,000 people, and the revenue in this sector exceeded 1 billion euro. In the same year, we had the first year when the revenue from po selling Polish games to foreign countries was greater than the amount spent by Polish uh, players on the games produced abroad. That is a novelty. N no older well, companions of the video game sector, like films and music, cannot boast that. By now, Poland has become one of Europe's key game development centers. Now we should think about new successes as the sector. Let's try to think what to do to multiply those successes, also investigating the challenges that we may 
um, face, like, for example, the IP law. I believe that this is one of the most important areas in our sector. As we know, the challenges here are plentiful. Alas, there is no time to discuss them all. However, the most important issues that I would like to discuss and that I examined getting ready for this meeting were um, the playability and possibility of playing them all over the world. This principle does not make it easy for us. There are different uh, legislations, different costs to provide protection of intellectual property rights around the world. Another challenge were the infringements and the efficiency of combating those. It varies depending on who, where, and what laws infringes. Those challenges that I considered also concern games, typically. The question of making Easter eggs, which are uh, allusions to other uh, games, also gameplays that are later published online, and other benefits generated by game fans. This suggested uh, that I could discuss the fourth group of things, namely the development of new uh, technologies, metaversum, that is certainly going to develop in a way providing us with plenty of food for thought. However, what I would like to discuss today is a different challenge, namely a certain hiatus between the legislation in force. In this case, this is the legislation on copyright and the market practice and the needs of the video or games sector. Now, that hiatus may assume a variety of forms. Some are marked, others can hardly be seen, but I believe that there are three important questions. First, the type of contract on transfer of copyright, which is material for the duration of the IP-based projects. The second thing are the differences n with the doctrine of cancelling the licenses that uh, contracts that were concluded for unlimited periods of time. And the third issue, the duties imposed on developers connected to the uh, One Digital Market Directive. Each of these questions is reflected in the law in force, and perhaps each of them was implemented to protect artists whose position is very often not that powerful. I believe that such solutions are useful, necessary, and simply needed. As intellectual property is one of the key resources of the game dev sector, and as the sector, we should do anything to protect it. But I thought that at the same time, we must realize that the reality around us is changing. It's absolutely different than the reality extant 30 years ago when the copyright law on copyright was introduced. And perhaps this is the moment when it makes sense to take a look at the current legislation to analyze whether they meet their functions that they were supposed to play when the legislator considered them and implemented them. Thus, I would like to start from the written form of the act on uh, sorry, contract on uh, sharing copyright or transfer of copyright. There are also others, but the other ones are not that important, so I skip them. Uh, referring to the ratio legis of signing those contracts in uh, the writing, that was probably the eagerness that one 
bad word, which mean that you give up your property rights to your work. Today, when access to knowledge and promotion is much easier, we have the internet and plenty of uh, webinars on the subject. At the same time, when there is the access and we try to do as many things as we can digitally, it could perhaps be a good idea to consider whether uh, keeping this requirement to conclude such contracts on, in writing is really necessary. Developers creating games often ensure artists living elsewhere in other cities and other states that they can cooperate. They employ them thanks to the online media. Uh, such artists can work in a studio without the need to move to its registered seat. They can do it because they can also share the results of the work online. That is very positive for the developers who in this way can choose their staff from a wider realm of candidates. And this is also good for the developers themselves because they don't have to make very difficult um, choices between the work of their dreams and the um, place where they have their home. Now, the Polish law uh, requires that the parties exchange the written form of the contract, and that may be a logistic challenge, and it extends the time of signing the contract. It increases the uncertainty. We must wait whether the post will finally deliver it or not. And this may cause delays in the project if we want to make sure that we have the rights to everything we should have our rights uh, to. A consequence of that can be a certain reluctance to sign our contracts under Polish law. There's an organizational burden on smaller developers, there are plenty of those, and then concluding contracts which are null and valid. It's a far-going consequence. However, it can happen so that some people will believe that delivery on time is uh, more important than legal safety. Can't you antedate some things? You can. Well, the market offers a plethora of solutions that let you sign contracts safely online. You give your email, you receive insight into the content of the contract, you can comment on it, and you can accept it without leaving your home. I believe that if you had such a qualified signature available for contracts, the life of developer studios would be easier, and so would be that of the artist, of the developer, who could um, dispose of the rights in an easier manner. Another question that we should um, ponder upon is the question of limiting the options to now a license granted to unlimited time. It's quite controversial also in uh, the judgments. I believe that every lawyer has a different opinion here. Recently, this is moving towards the option of um, nevertheless limiting such licenses. However, lack of certainty here makes operation in the market harder. And I'd like us to re-examine practice. Developing games, many developers use the assistance of other entities. They build engines, parts of code. That was with Cyberpunk 2077, where we use innovative software that offers highly credible animation of people in various language versions. In each language version, they move their lips differently. The problems connected to that status quo were, as a developer, we are forced to use 
software and works of other entities is that as a developer, we don't always find it our interest to purchase rights to such software. We only want those for selected games or for selected functionalities. And it's often the case that even if a developer wants it, they cannot purchase rights to such software because the artists, very often very large businesses with very strong position, don't find it their interest to get rid of their property rights. For them, it's, it pays much better to license uh, those to various businesses. The market has long ago taken steps to accommodate those, and there are now uh, lifelong licenses that you cannot terminate that are not sold once. In many US states, it doesn't cause any problems. Now, copying those solutions under the Polish law results in quite a large risk on the side of the uh, licensee, as the licensor can terminate that after five years. There are some practices that are there. For example, you may have a 20-year termination period. There are penalties for termination, but each of these solutions means that in case of uh, trouble, we may have an aggravated trouble. And um, seeing how long the time of development lasts, it may mean that if there is a dispute, the game may lose its functionality just after or even before the premiere. Now, to protect our um, interests, we may buy the rights to a work rather than buy a license. It causes very high costs. You lose many options. Developers sometimes opt for such a risk, however, hoping that no evil will befell them in future. So I believe that granting grounds for limiting um, the refusal of such a license would also provide options to um, act more logically and give us more security of the law. The third issue that I've mentioned is not connected to the uh, act on the copyright, but to the directive I mentioned. And this last duty may be problematic for our sector, because this makes the developer, obliges the developer to inform the creators at least annually how their works are used, whether they have licensed them or transferred rights. And the directive points to such examples of information as means of operation, revenue achieved, and the value of um, remuneration uh, due. As we don't know the Polish Act implementing the directive, all I'm referring to are the potential dangers that could be become valid if that were implemented without any exclusions. May I take another step back in this case as well and refer to the market reality and compare the legislation with the sector. As much as the first video games were simple algorithms with very simple graphics, currently games are highly complex products as the Previous speakers were right to note, to produce a single game, producers must combine th hundreds, thousands, if not millions of independent elements coming from different artists, developers, creators. Only after combining them appropriately, you have a game. 
With respect to the above, it's easy to guess that the need to inform each of the creators once a year about how their uh, produce is used, about the revenue, well, we could probably still remember it, but ways of exploiting those little works that build up this big hole would be a horrible and huge financial and organizational burden. Well, don't we use some of them not only for the games? We have different licensing contracts and agreements, thanks to which elements of our universe can uh, make it to different products, toys, clothes, collector products. Now, checking each of those tropes each, for each of those works and making sure that we have we realize which work is used to what extent and how is something that would be an overkill, in my humble opinion. The directive comes uh, to aid in such uh, situations and envisages the uh, possibility of excluding this information um, duty if the contribution of a uh, developer is not significant for the whole work. So, if um, not all formats are taken into account, this uh, introduces another burden. So, perhaps this um, obligation uh, in the Polish uh, transposition uh, of the, the directive <coughs> would uh, do well to reduce that or even do away altogether with that obligation relative to the gaming industry uh, because we may wake up in a reality uh, when developers instead of uh, developing games um, will uh, use a lot of their time to find out if um, a certain creation is not uh, present or recorded or active somewhere else. <coughs> uh, with, we need protection, but in a very specific industry, which is gaming, uh, this may carry uh, detrimental burdens because uh, projects will take longer to implement and um, um, you know, creators, developers uh, will uh, have to uh, give away some of their rights, uh, not least financial interests. And uh, it is worthwhile pointing out that uh, looking at the industry practice, uh, the creators of a game uh, not only have rights to the elements of a game, the building blocks, but also the game itself as a product of a joint effort of many people. The success of a game is the success of all the creators who worked in a given studio. And just like in Connected Vessels, then the benefits for uh, or the, the revenues uh, of the whole uh, um, studio and the whole industry uh, have a carryover to the um, creator's revenues. So such changes, not big ones uh, admittedly, um, should be introduced in the Polish transposition of the law so that Poland becomes the place to be or the go-to place for developers. Thank you, uh, Madam, for presenting your perspective. What is the uh, relationship between uh, regulations and uh, market reality? It is a um, um, good piece of news that um, uh, Poland is uh, a go-to place uh, for many people uh, who are active creatively in the gaming industry and who may link uh, that success with their own success. And now I invite uh, Ms. Maria Strobova uh, to um, share her remarks on the um, intellectual property protection in the games, in sports.
perspective of Natus Winzer in terms of current challenges related to the intellectual property in gaming sector, actually. Mm -hmm. Navi is the biggest, one of the biggest world sports organization. It was found back in 2009 in Kyiv. And comparing to my learned colleagues that develop games, we do not develop games, we just play, they, uh, play games, and sometimes we do it for really big money. Uh, but let's go to intellectual property. Uh, I spent some time thinking how is there any sphere where we do not use intellectual property. I actually failed to find the sphere. Uh, and today I will discuss the world of intellectual property in esports. I will briefly tell the challenges we face for each of these spheres. And I will, of course, leave you some food for thoughts. Um, for some perspective things, and especially if legal solution really meets the intellectual property business needs. Um, so let's go for the intellectual property in esports. First, Navi has two main sources of uh, intellectual property, what we call the Navi IP pool. First of all, it's the organization, and second is the intellectual property of the players. As organization, we hold the trademarks in numerous jurisdictions, um, they significantly vary in classes. Generally, we have the uh, classes that relate to video games, advertising, uh, clothes, and entertainment. Meanwhile, in some jurisdictions, you can also find that we have trademarks that relate to uh, restaurants and bars, because, for example, for some time in Kyiv, we had the Navi Fun Bar, and it was relevant to have this class of trademark. Uh, since 2020, we are expanding our existing trademarks to the countries that we have never thought about before. Uh, for example, it's Brazil or Singapore. And here comes actually the first challenge we face. Uh, and I think it's pretty common for many businesses, not just the gaming, but I would still highlight it. Uh, in 2020, Navi really boosted. It was the COVID time when the gaming industry started boosting really well and uh, I would say that operational processes grows like 40% plus and we decided that we really need to brand and the logo that you see now is our new logo uh, we had a little bit different one so what would be your next legal step when we talk about the rebranding logically and legally you would take the new logo and would go and register the new trademarks how far is it compatible with the, the business needs? How much money and how much time are you ready to spend for uh, registering new brand? Especially as like Navi, you have already uh, expanding a logo that is of course pretty much similar, but still it is not the same. That's a good question, you know, so um, that's pushing us to consider more the copyright protection. Of course, Navi has a lot of items protected by copyright. For example, uh, we talk not only about some pictures, some graphics, we also talk about the fonts, the slogans. And uh, copyright is very important for us because we have a very big in-house media and design team. And we create a lot of videos, we create a lot of graphics, pictures, and that's important to protect it. Ginka has mentioned a very important point of transfer of the intellectual property from the developer to, in our case, the esports organization. We already use the DocuSign to arrange the smooth and really convenient way of executing the agreements. At the same time, uh, having the legal basis if, is of utmost importance for us before we proceed to developing something, creating something, because we really need to be secured in this way and, of course, fast execution of the contracts is the good way to do this. I would only add one thing that is very also uh, challenging for us. Whenever the company works in multi-jurisdictional environments like we do, it's very important to diversify the modal IP transfer clauses because if we check the EU clauses, uh, for example, Polish clause that was highlighted already today, and check the US clauses or from some Asian countries, you we will see the big difference and it of course importance uh, of big importance to highlight it, not to find yourself unable to execute the agreement and protect yourself. Why copyright is also really beneficial for us? Because it allows us to protect uh, our brand, like to our total identity, or let's put the whole brand all together. Of course, we face limitations in each jurisdiction because, for example, in the USA, it's not possible to protect the phones, but in Ukraine, it is possible. So we uh, navigate between these limitations and use the opportunities that intellectual property protection tools provide for us. 
uh, for sure, as any big business that, w uh, that has at least some popular merch, we face another problem, it's counterfeit. And on boring days, we can cheer ourselves up by just going to AliExpress and submitting the claims for infringements. Um, Talking seriously, we are pretty successful in using the cease and desist mechanism by turning to different companies in the CIS or in Europe whenever we see that someone used uh, our logo or the design of our, from our store. So it's really good that we didn't even go to the court on this occasion because we stopped this infringement at the, very, uh, uh, at the early stage. Uh, well, the first and actually the second challenge, they are pretty common for various businesses. Uh, I will give you one more, and this is a, a really big uh, challenge for our industry. It's NFTs, I bet you know, non-fungible tokens. There are, many there are too many discussions around this already. And what I can tell you for sure is that we currently do not have a universal and effective, cost-effective, legally effective tool to protect ourselves and our intellectual property. You may ask how does Navi work with the NFTs? Uh, there are two recent deals that exactly are based on the non-fungible tokens. For example, there is uh, the first one is with ESL and uh, in cooperation with other Louvre Agreement members. Um, they, are, they will do the NFTs to like memorize the best CSGO moments, to say in this way. And within the other deal that I am not in position to disclose in details, unfortunately, there will be presented an NFT game uh, and they will be including the Inter Alia, our logo. Why is non-fungible token is a challenge for us? Let me give you just one example. Last week, we discovered that someone used our play a photo to create the NFT for OpenSea. It was the photo of Alexander Kostelev, also known as Simple. This is the world best player in CSGO. And this NFT obviously does not transfer any rights. And with the same level of uh, utility, people could just exchange the link to Instagram photo. Uh, but this is NFT and people receive, the person that created this receives money. So this is a problem. And here the next question, how far the company is ready to spend time money uh, to stop this infringement, which is an obvious infringement. This is a good question in the absence of any kind of tool to stop this, it's a really challenge. Nevertheless, the most exciting, as I think, part of our today conversation is the intellectual property of the players. Um, you can see four spheres where we basically work with the intellectual property of the players and uh, we already talked a bit about the NFTs. Uh, it's often challenging for everyone not involved in the esports work uh, to understand how we, what we do at all and why do we need intellectual property. So believe me, we are not limited with the games. I would uh, briefly talk about three other aspects. First, very important thing to mention here is that Comparing to EU or the US environment, we do not that much work with the agents, with the professional agents. For example, in the upcoming days, we are really looking forward to a nice cup, to announce cooperation with the uh, professional sports players from Poland. And now we are working with the agent. But in this years, there were like a couple of times we did this. Uh, what does it mean? This means that there is no one actually managing the intellectual property of the player, and this is Navi, who manages almost 100 IP of the players. This is pretty a big challenge and uh, a great privilege to be sincere. Um, which IP do we get from the players? We get name, nickname that is very valuable for the game industry, image, appearance, we get biographic data, voice, and of course we get the rights for the various derivatives hereof. What do we do with this IP? Uh, I won't tell you the secret that esports is inseparably tightened with the video games, and notably, right now, we are talking not only about the PC games, but already about the mobile games. For example, in 2020, we had just we had our first mobile roster, and now seven out of 15 rosters are mobile games rosters. Uh, and actually, they receive pretty the same price payments, so this is a great example to show how the gaming evolves and is how the esports involves in gaming industry. Um, what is the real answer to the question, what do we do with intellectual property? We get the revenue, so this my colleague from uh, CD Project mentioned that uh, it's a great way to generate revenue. I would talk about three models, as promised. The first one is players, when the players promote the games. 
it can take two forms. The first form when uh, the players appear during the tournaments and there appear the different content, media days and so on. And the second model when there is a special co-promotion agreement uh, according to which the players uh, also create some kind of content. Uh, when it comes to the tournaments, the tournaments operate to create a lot of content. They have the special media days to create some pictures and videos to promote themselves. Uh, and maybe the most challenging from the terms of legal uh, side and from the intellectual property side as well is the broadcasting of the gaming because they are involved, it involves the sub-licensing, how far the sub-licensing goes, it's one of the greatest questions we have. So, which points do we also, uh, we also tackle when it comes to the tournament participation? What is the scope of the provided IP? Is it exclusive? Is it perpetual? Is there a sub-license? If this sub-license is somehow limited, who owns and if it's the shared ownership of a created object, how it is used? Um, you know, there is no universal answer to this question. Of course, on the one side, there are organizations that the organizations, of course, do not want to share some kind of extra rights. On the other side, there are tournament operators that want to promote themselves, that generate revenue thanks to using the intellectual property of the famous players. And basically, we are now in the clash between the balance, balancing the rights uh, between these two parties. Um, and to say, uh, to put it in like a short way of kind of re um, solution that we have, uh, we are moving uh, in the interest of a sports organization as soon as we move from uh, Asia to the US. So the US are more friendly to sports organization, Asian organizations really want everything for every purpose and forever. Uh, the same is pretty much true for the content creating. We sometimes even bring some special content creators to perform the cooperation agreements, to stream, to create some graphics and so on. And here are almost the same questions like with the tournament operators, except from broadcasting maybe. And yeah, so the main issue is the desired scope of the intellectual property, because because we for sure, as soon as we manage this intellectual property of the players, we want to have it all. The second is in-game items. You might have seen this in-game cosmetics that does not give you any privileges, but just makes your arms more beautiful. Um, here, the main issue is who owns this, because sometimes it's Navi who creates this uh, in-game object, sometimes it's the players who create, but they should share the revenues with the organization, so how does it all work in the terms of contracts? It's a good question, and it all, it all depends again on the jurisdiction. Maybe the most interesting question that I face here is that what happens to already sold in-game items as soon as the game developer wants to stop you than them in the game? This is a good question and this is something to discuss together with our colleagues, the game publishers. I already told you about NFT game integration, but in Navi we are really lucky to have a unique integration in the gaming world. It's integration of our play into the game. Uh, in December 2021, Rage of the Legends integrated uh, Simple as the character in uh, their game. Uh, this character was available for purchasing for a pretty short time. Uh, and now it is available for using in the game for those who purchase it uh, for as long as the developer will need this. This is a unique thing on the field. Uh, of course, we deal with the licensing again, but the best question I can put here is, okay, what happens if Simple leaves Navi and Navi has the, uh, manages this intellectual property and has all the rights? What happens then? How to deal with the Rage Shadow Legends and what will happen at all? Um, I will now go to summarizing and of course I will be glad to answer all the questions. So my summary is that esports is one more sphere so closely tightened to gaming that we are lucky to share all pros and all the cons of the sphere. Uh, my colleagues today mentioned the metaverse in terms of progressive development uh, in the sphere. I do not think that we will really soon face this, uh, but this is something that we should already consider um, because it will be for sure the next challenge after NFTs. Uh, thank you for having me today. It was a great pleasure and I will gladly address all the questions. 
Pani Mario, bardzo dziękujemy za Pani wystąpienie, za podzielenie się Państwa doświadczeniem z zakresu Maria, thank you very much for sharing your experience in the area of intellectual property protection. Please note what is the new issue that comes to light, the protection of the image of athletes or players. And now um, we will hear the representative of um, the Patent Office uh, and what the Patent Office thinks about the protection uh, of industrial designs and uh, uh, trademarks intellectual property in gaming. Uh, thank you, Peter. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I will wait for the presentation to appear, and I would like to, in the meantime, thank everyone uh, for um, making it possible for me to join this uh, uh, eminent uh, group of panelists. Uh, I think I, I cannot add anything to that. Um, you see, you will see, in, you have seen from the presentation that we can protect various elements of uh, games um, uh, as industrial designs uh, and trademarks. Um, but uh, from the standpoint of the patent office, uh, I have to admit, as uh, Dr. Baliski said, thank you very much for, for, for assisting me. The use of <coughs> third party trademarks in games gaming or rather in uh, computer games is not a simple matter. But I can add here from the perspective of the patent office when we <coughs> assess uh, the misleading potential or the similarity issue, uh, there is very little guidance on this aspect. But as regards um, the guidelines uh, coming from the EU IPO, <coughs> there is one uh, wording saying that uh, in relation to uh, the potential to mislead um, in games, there the visual aspect is much more important than uh, semantics or um, sound. Uh, and uh, this, this is still in force uh, issued in a, in a specific uh, document of guidance. Uh, so uh, we, we generally <coughs> base our reasoning and practice uh, on, on these guidances and on the most recent uh, rulings. And now I will move on to the issue uh, of the matter, the crux of the matter. What are the elements to be protected in video games in various uh, legal regimes? Much has been already said by the previous speakers, so I will not uh, prolong what uh, I have to say. I will me me move on to trademarks, what we most frequently protect. Uh, this will be the title of a game. Uh, and uh, let's look at an older game which um, recently uh, had its 35th anniversary, The Legend of Zelda. It has 19 titles, several spin offs, 10 EU. Um, um, trademarks, including Triforce, uh, which is uh, uh, a, an, an artifact. <coughs> and uh, not only trademarks are protected, also uh, copyright is applied here. <coughs> Initially, Ravel's Bolero uh, was to be applied, and then the developer uh, understood that there there is still copyright in force for that uh, piece of music, so he composed his own. Uh, sometimes the title uh, reflects uh, the creativity of um, game developers. But it's worthwhile remembering to check whether the title can actually gain protection, whether it can be registered. Because uh, due diligence at the stage of uh, that research uh, can save us a lot of hassle. 
And there was a company that uh, created a name, uh, sorry, uh, a game by the name of Ion Maiden. And um, this was um, at odds with uh, the heavy metal Iron Maiden band. So Iron Maiden uh, fortunately uh, had uh, a class 9 registration uh, on computer games and video games, and they took the case uh, uh, to court. Uh, and uh, as has been previously said, many uh, conflicts are settled out of court. Therefore, uh, uh, Ion Fury was the next version of the name uh, for which the uh, company settled. And um, there are also words which uh, have uh, issues, like ordinary words and ghost. There was a contention between uh, UVSoft. They used ghost in several products, and ghost itself for electronic arts would uh, create uh, a, uh, un an unfair um, advantage. Uh, so such registration, such registration was not granted. Uh, another issue, Candy. I hope you uh, remember the Candy Crush saga uh, case. And despite the fact that one company, one of the companies, did not uh, oppose, but the monopolization of the word Candy, which is used in various computer games, and here the community uh, took action and many uh, manu producers, developers uh, started an initiative um, named Candy Jam, and they published a growing number of games uh, containing the word candy. Uh, so nominally can be um, uh, granted here. And uh, another example is the word simulator, which often appears in names of video games. Um, and so it pays off to uh, check beforehand if uh, such uh, names uh, that we want to register trademarks have not been uh, uh, granted protection earlier, especially in the gaming world. But there are also uh, well-known um, visual um, trademarks, for example, an Angry Games, uh, sorry, Angry Birds, which have been uh, registered for computer gaming. There is a new bird uh, already published, not registered yet, but we know based on database that uh, that um, new character will join the Angry Bird. Uh, universe. Uh, here you see other uh, elements and uh, characters, uh, also titles, names, uh, which are protected by computer games as well as uh, in computer games, also slogans. Slogans should be creative, uh, not too obvious, but some of them are so popular that looking at the slogan, uh, we can already guess uh, what uh, game it relates to. And uh, also graphical uh, signs, words, uh, they are the most popular protected elements, but there are also other uh, trademarks that can be uh, protected, like in The Legend of Zelda. Uh, there was copyright on the sound, but uh, uh, the Tetris melody, for example, comes in here. Uh, it is also protected, uh, but it is presented in the uh, register as uh, a score. Uh, thanks to uh, the new regulation on EU, <coughs> trademarks, there is a new way of uh, registering uh, such um, sounds uh, where um, 
The submission can include uh, MP3 or other format sounds. I'm not sure if you heard that. <clears throat> it is a sound that uh, uh, is found in some games. It is also protected. I think uh, this was registered in the Japanese Patent Office. Thank you. Another example of new uh, trademarks that can be uh, protected and used in computer games, those are mobile uh, signs, and an example is shown here. This is a short MP4. Uh, moving video uh, which does not contain sound and it can be used to uh, differentiate certain products but it also includes pictograms pictograms themselves can also be registered for protection but they just have to be uh, somehow creative and the latest category that can also be protected are multimedia um, uh, trademarks uh, where both um, moving video and sound are presented this is related to console games so please show that Often protected trademarks. These are the 3D trademarks. What is worth remembering here? The looks of those are often protected, but not all 3D trademarks can be registered. Those that result from technical functions from their own nature, whose shape is only ornamentational, cannot be registered. For those we have designs and patents. Sometimes this also results from strategy. In case of trademark, we have protection that is not limited by time and we can extend it into infinity every 10 years. In case of industrial designs, there is a 25-year long period of protection. Let's remember that our trademarks are also protected like in this way, the ones on the left are protected as trademarks, the one on the right as design. Computer animated figures and video games. As a design, design is a form of a work produced by colors, lines, contours. However, the looks, the appearances of figures are not very often protected as design. Design is usually used for protecting devices, um, 2D and 3D uh, dimensions. So these are the most frequent applications for video game applications in protection in case of industrial um, design. Equipment can be protected with industrial design, but there are also cases of similar consoles being protected as trademarks, and in this case their protection can be extended into infinity. Right, I'd like to mention what else can be protected as uh, industrial design GUI, the uh, graphic user interface. In most cases, those are nonetheless parts of computer software, yet this interface in computer games can be protected in this form. In a sense, this shows that protection at the level of industrial design takes into consideration new technologies. May I refer here to what Ms. President said at the outset of this conference. She mentioned the 
amendment, the novella of the Act on Industrial Property. May I mention here only that one of the significant changes to be introduced here will be the opportunity, the possibility of applying collective, making collective applications. You'll have an opportunity to have multiple trademarks in a single application, and this is going to be helpful for applying multiple uh, trademarks. Right, drawing to the end of my presentation, I'm a bit beyond time, I'd like to refer to those new technologies. And in the EU, we also plan a legislative reform on industrial design at the EU and national levels. We also envisage accounting for new technologies, protecting industrial design that makes use of 3D and possibly also 4D technologies. I must say that many states analyze legislation now to provide options for protecting those intangible objects, holograms, projections, uh, extended uh, reality, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, they are connected, however, they are separate and some of them uh, include an element of reality, like Pokemon Go, and others are virtual. Will the uh, intellectual property uh, law keep up the pace? Well, questions remain, and we'll see. WIPO takes into consideration the new technologies, uh, researches uh, graphic user interfaces. Well, Singapore is now ahead of many countries. In 2017, they uh, made guidelines for protection of intangible, non-feasible non-physical products, but even that is not 100% sure. You have new technologies also in trademarks. Metaverse has already been uh, mentioned as far as trademarks go. Some companies like Nike and McDonald's are already applying for virtual um, marks, virtual clothing, virtual food. How they are going to be used, well, is a question to be left. NFTs, the non-tradable tokens, are already discussed. Uh, there are already first one first questions in the American market whether these infringe trademarks or not. Um, these are going to be very interesting questions. And this world is going to surprise us more than once. Thank you very much. Well, it's going to be really very stimulating to see the patent office keeping pace with the technology and allowing registration of trademarks and also um, designs. Thank you very much, Director. I hope that this will inspire game developers. Well, I hope that you will register and protect your intellectual property. Thank you very much for participating in this panel. And may I invite us all to a short break. We reconvene at a quarter to two. And just one more thing. During the break on chat, we will see a link to a questionnaire. Please fill it in and see you after the break.
Welcome. After the break, we are starting. Okay. I'm starting without a microphone, I believe. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, cordially after a short break, and we start the third panel. What support is needed for the game dev sector? And let's have our guest from the Ukrainian um, Intellectual Property Institute. He will chair this panel. Good afternoon. Welcome. I can moderate the panel today in Ukrainian, so I will nonetheless address you in I could nevertheless address you in English. It is very important for us, the experts working in intellectual property, it's very important for us to know and to spread the information about what support we need in this sector. I've mentioned the difficulties, how to um, support young people in their on their path to creativity. Now, it's very important to realize in what forms we can support game dev in global and national markets. I'm so glad that I can welcome here Mateusz Wilczak from Polski Game Dev PL. He's a developer and journalist involved in the promotion. He works for CD Action. We also have a project manager from GovTech Polska, and we have also Richard Feralek. Of the World Intellectual Property Office and Marcin Sava from the Ministry of Development and Technology. I'm not going to waste your time, and I'm just passing the floor to Mateusz Wilczek. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm very happy to be at this conference. If this were not a problem, I'd move towards the... Yes, I don't have to sit. I don't have to sit. Great. I'd love to address you from this place. Now, the question that you asked in the panel carries a simple answer. Polish game dev needs primarily money. And here I'd like to start from three dates, which I believe are very important in the context of what has happened here. A coalition contract between SPD, Greens and Liberals was signed recently in Germany, and one of its foundations is support for game dev, both direct money coming in and also uh, release of certain uh, bureaucratic breaks that we uh, hit. These are not the only uh, support instruments that our Western neighbors offer. Already under Angela Merkel, uh, national uh, developers were promised 250 million euro in five years. Another date, also very important, perhaps even more important, on 28th of January, when Russian uh, troops were still on the Ukrainian border, the Russian Duma promised 7 billion rubles at the exchange rate then. It was 370 million zloty. However, Kremlin required that these are patriotic games that would uh, praise the mm, bravery of Russians during the great patriotic war, as they call the Second World War. Now I have got a, a quote ready from uh, the deputy to the Duma, who emphasized this unprecedented support for the game death, and he 
growth. The popularity of video games is huge and growing. In the first year of the pandemic, the Russian sector grew by a third. The impact of games on human mind is too big not to use them. It would be far more long-sighted to promote patriotism, interest in the history of a country, skill of independent thought and correct assessment of um, the political situation. Let's not uh, it delude ourselves. These would be propagandist games that would not be bought all around the world. Now, the soft power and diplomacy in Russia will certainly not be obliterated by the video games. Well, video games won't obliterate, won't efface the um, crimes connected to Date Doris, a UK Minister of Culture, promised eight more million pounds as the president of UK, the Interactive Entertainment Association commented, we've clamored for the fund and today's decision is an expression of support for our sector will help us finance the games at the same time developing new jobs in the UK. For these three sectors, this is good news. However, it's 28th April, we're in Poland and Warsaw, and let me turn your attention to the fact that the support instruments that were here don't continue. No fast track, no gaming, no brand support. Development of the creative sectors, yes, there is, as an initiative of the Ministry of Culture, but that's just a drop in the sea. The maximum amount of funding was just 170,000 zloty. Don't misunderstand. Me. Yes, that money could uh, finance plenty of interesting initiatives. I mean here Indigenous Polska, which used 100,000 zloty to promote Polish games in China and the US. Vitruvio, who create uh, the Games Industry Conference, they will uh, reinforce its educational um, face, but will also help us uh, visit Gamescon, which is the most frequented fair in Köln in Germany. Expo 2022 was in the last weekend, a job fair very important for the people who are only looking for employment in the video games sector. However, this money is not big. A year ago, the um, Support was nearly 5 million, now it's much smaller. Game developers must compete um, with visual artists and are the new media artists, whoever they are. Now, we must say it clearly that we've reached a very particular moment in digital history. The indie apocalypse is a word that's gaining on popularity. There are many of those. There were more than 10,000 of those on Steam, precisely 10,696, which is why it's very important that, as Poland, we take serious interest in this sector. Why? Well, in the US, there are no people who wouldn't hum Young Laosia. No one's waiting for Amigus Mruz's um, stories or waiting for Wojtek Smarzowski's new uh, premiere film. In the digital culture, we set the tone. Cyberpunk 2077 in just a year sold in 18 million copies. Dying Light 1 reached 20 million and its sequel in just a month 5 million. Outriders 3.5 million are consumers. Those numbers are not the only. We should really stop hoping, maybe not stop hoping, but realize that it will be difficult for us, not us as Poland, but us as Europe, to create uh, a company to match Google, Twitter, Facebook, now Meta, but in digital culture, we set the tone. It's not the music of the future, it's happening now. May I just draw your attention that cyberpunk was not an aesthetic that would be fashionable. Netflix withdrew Altered Carbon, which might have been 
It's most expensive production after just two seasons. The new Blade Runner proved a commercial flop, as they call it. Now, Cyberpunk, even though it made a debut in a bit of mistake, but it promoted this fashion and it also um, made a lot of elements budding. There are cyberpunk books, comics, and a series will now be making its start at Netflix. Uh, the Witcher resulted in a board game, Oshi energy drinks we can buy, and of course also a Netflix series. You know that all perfectly well. I believe that the Polish state has plenty of mechanisms and instruments to support the Polish game dev, and this is the proper time to do it, especially that the three dates I mentioned first are not all that mark grants given to uh, states in the EU. Now, an own version of so-called culture relief is even granted in Slovakia. I dare say even that pumping money into game dev, into digital culture, is a Polish raison d'etre, because it realistically increases our capacity in soft power and culture diplomacy. However, how to do it? First of all, well, there are those demands that Poland has promoted through uh, memories of Warsaw Uprising, the Missourian Lakes. They may be important, don't misunderstand me, but we could promote Poland, and it is happening yet through various grassroots movements as a country of modern people who find their proper place in the digital revolution, even coming to the fore ahead of the states that seem to have a greater potential in this digital culture. As yet, there's been plenty of support from, for example, Game In program that was focused on R&D. However, was it the proper direction? Let me uh, modestly mention that CD Projekt received uh, money for Red Engine. Po Flying Wild Cock, another Warsaw-based studio, received money for Roadhog Engine. Yet both those tools are something that they no longer use. CD Projekt moved to Unreal Engine 5, and Unreal Engine is also used by Flying Wild Hog, who produce their four new games. Technology in game dev is basically cheap and easily accessible. I don't know if we are forced to reinvent the wheel, if what we miss, what we lack, and a European Games Development Federation and other organizations of the sector is that what we miss is content innovation, not tech innovation. And yes, IP Box is important for Poland, but it reaches relatively few developers as they need plenty of money to provide such a relief. Now, the Polish video games sector, which you can read from the Game Industry Conference and Polish uh, Agency for Enterprise Development uh, proves is based on small um, companies. The giants like Flying Wild Hog, Techland, and CD Projekt Red are a few. By the way, the uh, Flying Wild Hog is now property of the Sw Swedish Embracer. And here we come to the uh, takeovers and mergers. Now it's coming to us from China. Tencent is now the largest um, shareholder of Blue Team, owner of Cenega, Kulog, and Move, which it bought very recently from Russian Atwansi. And it's got also shares in other studios. I believe that we all should be keen on major brands significant for Poland, remained in Poland. It's a, really a historical opportunity we're facing, and I'm afraid that we can fail to uh, use it. Let me, at the end, mention the question of archivization, which is a burning project, and that hasn't been solved. Now, there is a parliamentary, sorry, a pre-election program of uh, 
Law and Justice, who promised the Video Game Center, that is, to contribute to the reinforcement of the Polish game dev sector as a vibrant branch of economy and culture. And now, even Atari Online PL, the largest archive of Atari games, operates, in fact, illegally. The Polish Act on Copyright and Related Rights does not allow copying. This is breaking the law. However, without that, those games would have been lost. And it seems that it's the highest time for a complex reflection on how Poland can help the digital cultural developers as, for example, the film have long been on the um, inject, living on the injections from state money. 96% of Polish games are exported and our national narrative develops and extends thanks to those producers we have in Poland. It breaks through thanks to those studios. There are more than 600 of those. That's an opportunity that Poland has never before had, and I hope we are going to uh, draw conclusions from it and also mm, make use of it. Thank you very much, Mateusz. I believe that Poland has an opportunity to carry out these projects efficiently, and I'm also a consumer of Polish game productions. Thank you very much for what you do as a journalist and generally for everything you do in this field. Thank you for the numbers you've given us and for focusing on this being an element of propaganda. Game dev is not always used in its proper border, borders. We should develop games, but we shouldn't limit ourselves into, the, into any framework that would be illegal or morally doubtful. Let's now pass to the following speaker. Can I invite Tomasz Topolewski? Tomasz, the floor is yours. Szanowni Państwo, nie wiem, czy mnie słychać. Bardzo bardzo dziękuję. Szanowni Państwo, Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. I'd like to thank the organizers. I'm so glad that I can share with you my perspective as well as an attempt to answer the question of what in our public sector we can do for the Polish creative industry. Gulf techs um, all around the world carry that vision that is the flexible approach to various problems which we could call a new approach to new technologies. I believe that there is no illusion that the Polish games uh, market could be a powerful uh, and is a powerful uh, brand. All this sector can be qualified into the new tech sector. The mission of uh, the this conference is very important for protection of that thought all around the world. Those projects that we could carry out with the Polish Patent Office, well, when the Polish Patent Office came, approached us to uh, help them with cataloging and then, in fact, giving us the um, opportunity to increase the protection was something that came when we realized that the gaming sector was one that was difficult to implement this protection. Uh, the number of uh, productions is so big that neither experts nor the human eye can manage it, and they have to make use of artificial intelligence, but also of the machine learning mechanisms to speed up work and also to optimize it. And 
technologicznej. Oczywiście odnosząc się tu do polskiej myśli, now, kluczowe, looking at the Polish technical thought, tak jak też już zostało powiedziane, ale to są ogólne. We see that 96% of Polish productions are exported, and now this efficient protection and its mechanisms are of key importance for protecting Polish uh, developers against abuse in this aspect. Now, I'd focus on the directions of this expert. Now, it's General West, US and Canada. Key from our perspective, I'd say that they are culturally and business-wise closer to us in this approach now this is the place where the plot is are understandable but also difficult now India China and uh, Japan which are about 10 percent of export for Poland provide a powerful potential when I mean potential um, I mean one thing for example 54 percent in Asia Pacific it's, um, well, it's the market that you have thanks to the games. Well, we don't reach a large pool of the players there in the far east. Other than that, these are very characteristic markets. I mentioned proximity, talking about the West, Canada, US. These courses, Asia Pacific, are distinctive culturally and also in their business approach. And this carries um, a challenge for the public sector, which could be termed uh, such as um, supporting export programs, which help uh, small independence, uh, independent studios understand the uh, specific conditions in non-European countries I mentioned. One of the challenges that is also worthwhile mentioning is cultural diplomacy which is also mentioned. This is a challenge which may lead to a situation where Poland uh, is perceived as a country uh, seen as a technological power, a leader, um, a player that um, sets the stage um, that Poland is first of all um, considered as a tech leader uh, where uh, innovative passion is clearly salient. Uh, but to export, um, we need products. And here we reach the potential which the Polish industry holds. This uh, potential is high, reports confirm that. Some authors go on to state that the Polish industry is a European leader and stands a chance to become a trendsetter in coming years. To some degree we already are that, but they may become a global trendsetter. When we speak of developing the Polish potential of this industry, it is worthwhile uh, focusing on uh, the variety of uh, support programs accessible to the gaming industry. The ministry will likely have their own perspective on that subject, but I would like to underscore that Poland overall has um, a, a handsome support for uh, startups for small medium sized businesses. There are programs addressed to the gaming industry also, but what is um, also involved um, goes not only in the direction of game dev, there are not only um, startup developing institutions. Um, environment building institutions which are important for uh, 
revving up the uh, Polish potential and keeping it at a high level. Um, but if we want to export uh, such products, uh, Poland has its uh, national programs and there are European Union programs. Uh, but to further develop, um, we should um, tap R&D money, not uh, exactly in the area of technology, but more um, emphasis should be put, more attention should be devoted to Mm, the artistic aspect. Um, the technological mm, dimension is, of course, important, but mm, at least equally important is the artistic part of the game. Uh, this is a must-be if we want to engage even more people in development, uh, if we want to identify mm, Poland with that kind of calling card. Such programs are already in place, um, uh, such programs coming from the Ministry of uh, Culture and National Heritage. Um, one of these games was uh, just presently shown in Boston, uh, a game that uh, is uh, has in its content a new gaming technology and was uh, presented in Boston. We were able to organize that as GovTech. Uh, when we speak of um, a market potential, we have to point out a challenge related to um, a shortage of um, competent uh, personnel, competent employees. Uh, we have heard how um, many young innovators are out there. Uh, which is wonderful, so I think we should look into uh, education as one of the main modulators of potential in the um, educational sector lie the answers to our questions, doubts and challenges regarding that industry. So our focus of interest should um, emphasize creativity of children and adolescents. This is uh, the area where you know, we can experiment, uh, and that experimentation translates into creativity. Such uh, innovators, uh, creators are needed if we think in the long term. Uh, labs of the future are, amongst others, um, such uh, tools. Uh, there is one billion zlotys worth of equipment that is to be provided to Polish schools where the students will be able to go into robotics and also exercise creativity. And uh, perhaps in gaming they may discover that this is not only fun but also something that um, in induces creativity. Um, this is just a step away from becoming a Polish unicorn. And uh, in a long-term perspective, uh, we must provide highly educated uh, human resources uh, and keeping not only keeping them in the country but also drawing uh, people from other countries to Poland. At today's conference, we need to um, develop clearly uh, IT and technical um, potential, but at the same time, the artistic potential must not be forgotten. Uh, the development of games is interdisciplinary. That's why we require an interdisciplinary approach to the whole of the market and to our way of thinking about the gaming sector. As Poland, we certainly are strong, so let's export uh, our inventions, let's help the industry do that, let's develop our internal potential, but first and foremost, let us do it uh, with uh, the future in mind. This interdisciplinary edge uh, 
uh, I think uh, can be developed not only in Poland only, but also in collaboration with other countries. And I, I urge all the stakeholders to consider that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this detailed um, analysis and the stats of um, the export of Polish gaming products. I think this is a clear um, evidence that, that you are competitive, that Poland is going to be able to uh, stimulate uh, innovation and uh, create uh, in, uh, generations of innovators uh, for whom all of this is actually being done and, and developed. Now I invite um, Richard Frelek. Richard, are you there? Thank you very much. Let me just quickly turn on my presentation. And you should have a black screen. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Andrei. Uh, Z góry przepraszam tłumaczy, ale zawsze chcę skorzystać z okazji, żeby powiedzieć kilka słów w um, ukochanym języku ojczystym. Um, sorry. Obiecuję, uh, że będę próbował... To the interpreters, I always love to say a few words in my beloved language, that is Polish. Uh, I would also like to thank um, uh, Madam President Demba Siwek of the Polish Patent Office and uh, Mr. Uh, Putin, the Director General of uh, the Ukrainian uh, Institute of Intellectual Property. And uh, I would uh, like to greet uh, our colleagues uh, from Ukraine, especially cordially, who are also celebrating IP Day uh, despite uh, the extraordinary situation they face. I uh, am uh, certain that we are in for uh, future product products. Poland, Ukraine, and WIPO uh, have already been uh, collaborating uh, in various areas. Um, also, during last year's um, meeting in Katowice, uh, gaming companies from Poland and Ukraine uh, already were sharing their experience in the area of uh, IPO uh, and patent law, and uh, the success lists uh, for both uh, uh, countries is wonderful. Um, uh, the uh, victories of Natus Vincere um, are certainly uh, bearing witness to that, uh, and uh, we uh, envisage uh, new victories by Natus Vincere and a new Witcher edition by uh, CD Project Red. Sorry again for the interpreters that I they had to interpret from Ukraine. Uh, now allow me to uh, switch to English. Uh, as you know, this year's World IP Day focuses on the young people and how they are stepping up to innovation challenges using their energy, creative and creativity to steer a course to a better future. The video game industry is one of those area, areas where so many young creative and innovative minds meet from software developers, musicians, storytellers, hardware inventors, designers, to game streamers and professional players. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Richard. We, we see only a black screen. Yes, or maybe... yes, you will. Yes, that's foreseen. The, yeah. But there is a sort of PowerPoint. It will be the top. next slide. It's I all right? The, yes. It should be fine, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, thanks. Uh, and all these people I mentioned that are involved in the development of games and, hard, and hardware, they all use the IP ecosystem. While back in the days when pushing the high score on Super Mario on my Game Boy, I was not yet, yet aware. But today when playing, for example, Cyberpunk 2077, I see intellectual property everywhere. That is why I'm really happy to use this opportunity to say a few words about our new upcoming project. 
Uh, it is currently, currently under finalization, but today is an excellent opportunity to give you a sneak peek. Uh, let's say maybe a, a trailer uh, and what we call it the quest for intellectual property a video games developers journey. Uh, the main messaging of, of this present of the project is that we want to that IP is at the heart of the video game industry and video game companies are contributing to national economic growth. So that's why we want to help level up the IP of the video game developers to succeed in this industry. So why do we want to do it? We want to help the SME video game developers grow through IP. We want to create a networking opportunity between small and big companies. And I'm happy to also refer to the previous presentation. We also want to create a networking opportunity between the Central European and Baltic States region, as well as the Asia and the Pacific region, because the project is going to be dedicated to these specific regions. We also want to create a space for networking and substantive discussions among legal and business experts on video games. At the end of the day, this is what we, of course, hope for. We want to see the, that we want to contribute to national econo economic development in targeted regions through successful and IP savvy video game companies. How, uh, who do we want to target? So the main beneficiaries that we want to approach is going, are going to be the owners of indie studios and medium-sized studios, including small publishers and new game creators, developers, which have some already experience in the industry. And here again, underlining that this is going to be a project dedicated to the SEBS and Asian and Pacific region. Additionally, in order, of course, for the whole project to, to be put together well and for, for it to be successful, we also want to target and get the involvement of representatives of large studios, publishers, consoles, and platforms, video game legal experts, in-house lawyers, of course, and the gamers themselves, which of course is always uh, difficult to get everyone on board, but um, we'll say a few words about that in a second. How do we want to do it? No ties. I'm not wearing one now. The, the original idea was no suits, but then someone complained, what do, what do I have against suits? So we're staying with no ties. Uh, we want to have the, the project will deliver content, which is going to be short, selected, and useful. So it's not going to be uh, hours of lectures and pages and pages of documents to read. We really want to have short and targeted content because we are very aware of the fact that the game developers have, have hundreds, if not thousands of other tasks to do instant, besides taking care of intellectual property. We want to speak in a language that is more business than legal. So it's going to be a mix between the business and legal aspects of intellectual property itself. Because if you think of the video game industry, it's one of those industries when you say IP, it's not going to be only a legal term, it will be a business term. Uh, now, we will have five levels of content, which will be following uh, the game development stages. I'll say a few words about that in a second. And each level of the content will have a three-step approach. So firstly, we will have a podcast, a short podcast, which will be an interview of a successful company about a specific issue on that stage of development of a video game. That would be followed with, an IP, with IP clinics, well, where we will have one-on-one -on -one meetings with interested video game companies where we provide business legal advice. And then we will have an informal online meeting for everyone interested just to have a kind of an informal chat and discussion about that specific level. After each level, there will be a kind of a level power up, which will be a one page checklist of the basic, most important things you have to remember about intellectual property at that stage of video game development. Uh, and then we're also thinking of having one end event and one, one midway event. Like I said, one of the main tasks of this is going to be creating a network. Uh, currently, the idea is that the network will be created on LinkedIn because we already have quite a, quite a large um, networking opportunity already there. But we are also very aware that, of course, Discord could also be a very interesting place where this network could be created. We're still in discussion on that. Uh, when it comes to the informal online meetings, we want to keep to kind of the atmosphere of the game, uh, game development. So we're considering of using Gather Town in order to have all these informal meetings that we 
are considering to do. Uh, when it comes to the partners, uh, what I, uh, we, are, we are already in talks with many of them, including associations, federations, big publishers, large studios, console developers, successful indie studios, governments, ministries, and IP offices. I'm also already, I can't tell the exact names at this moment because it's still an R&D phase, but I can tell you that already we have a lot of commitment and cooperation on this project with the biggest publishers among them or associations, federations. Uh, when it comes to the content, like I said, we will be creating these new podcasts, which will be available from our webpage for anyone to download. There will be this one short page, Level Up Power Ups, uh, that will be also available. Uh, what I can also already say, and I'll use a bit of an opportunity for the promotion of what we already have in WIPO, is that we, we have a very nice video, which was produced, by the way, on the occasion of the Internet Governance Forum, which we'll be using, of course, for promotional purposes about IP and video games. But we also have the Mastering the Game publication, which is it's a major publication from the World Intellectual Property Organization about all the aspects of IP that you need to consider. So we will have we already have that. And we'll be making references within those one pages to that document if someone wants to find out more. Uh, and then, of course, we have a new PlayStation infographic, which we'll be building on as well. And of course, please feel, feel free to have a look at it from our webpage. And we have different distance learning courses if someone would want to learn more about IP beyond the project which I'm speaking about right now. Now, when it comes to the content, we're wanting, we want to build it around, you know, level up your IP. Uh, and there will be those five levels that we are considering. The level one will be preparing for the journey, level two, adventure time, level three, the launch as the final destination with a question mark, company of players and new frontiers. Uh, very quickly, just to go through all those levels. Again, this is, this is neither the final list nor an exhaustive list, but these are the topics which we are considering to, to tackle within each level. Uh, but in the end of the day, we'll be very much cutting down so that this all the content will be digestible and short and straight to the point. So of course, we'll have to be limiting this. But at the level one, we are considering to do the IP and the concept phase. So, create, so here we're thinking of creating a, a discussion about to have a discussion about creating original content or licensing rules so video game companies can have different approaches do they want to create their own ip or do they want to license it license it out from other media like books for example for the witcher uh, we are thinking about uh, of course here we would need perhaps to dis discuss issues about ip and financing or how to use how to consider intellectual property issues in your pitch uh, for level two uh, it's going to be more the development phase of the game. So all the copyright, all the related rights that come into play, the trade secrets, the patents, designs, and what can eventually already at that stage be considered for trademarking. Fictional marks, this was an interesting already discussion. Global development, that was also discussed that games are being developed not in one country, but in many countries at the same time. Uh, original or license engine, that was also mentioned today. Uh, music licensing, it's something which is always an ongoing discussion. Architecture and real life. So how, how can architectural real life um, buildings be uh, included into video games? That was as well today discussed. And choosing the right platforms and what would be the IP consequences of that. Uh, for level three, the launch is the final destination. So here, perhaps more about IP marketing, merchandising, what can be trademark? Because, for example, it can be the slogans, it can be the characters themselves. I need IP monitoring and enforcement. And so, what are the tools that can help eventually a game developer to monitor their IP globally? Uh, licensing to other media. Uh, this is something to consider. IP and streaming players, self studio, and IP. Level four would be the company of players. So here about all the relations between different stakeholders within the video game development process. So that would be with employees, with the publishers, console developers, streamers, players, testers, and so on and so on, because there are many different relations that exist within the video game uh, development and they are all very IP heavy. The, Fourth level here, we uh, the fifth level, sorry, we, here we would like to speak about the new frontiers, uh, about the NFTs, virtual property, esports, metaverse, VR, AR, 
although perhaps some of these are not new anymore, but there are many new technological developments taking place. And then of course, game tech and beyond games, how are video game technologies being used beyond gaming itself. Uh, now, the mid-season event, what we are considering is going to be IP and marketing for women in gaming. And here, of course, there are many international organizations which could be very closely partnered with on this. The last event, the final kind of season event, which we're thinking of, uh, the provisional title is Come Sit, Have a Drink and Tell Us Your IP Story. So like in some of these RPG games, you have to sit down and tell your story. Here we'll be asking the game developers to tell their IP story in front of a larger audience uh, to, to perhaps maybe even do it in the form of a pitch. But here, this is something under currently under development. Uh, more uh, in detail how this would look like, the timeline. So we would want to start around September the 19th and every three weeks go into the next level. Uh, the mid-season event we want to have on November 9th. The end of the season event we want to have mid-January 2023. So it's a long-term project. And despite that, I know we are aware that it's a, almost six, it's six months or, or five months time. But again, underlining that the content that will be produced will be really straight to the point and very short and very useful. So we will be very aware of the time that the video game developers can uh, dedicate to, to this project. Uh, to illustrate more how uh, a, a level cycle will look like. So firstly, uh, we would be launching the podcast and we'll be opening up the signing up for video game companies in SEPs and Asia and Pacific to sign up for the IP clinics mentoring kind of uh, moments. And that will be going on in the second week. The third week we'll be launching the level power up. So that would be the checklist for that stage of game development. And finally, at the end, we we'll want to have kind of a informal meeting, perhaps on gather with the experts, with the video game companies to have a, a more relaxed without tie or maybe even without the suits kind of meeting. Um, now, at the end of the day, so what we want to do is that we want to get the game developer more interested in intellectual property. We do not want to speak to the game developer for hours and hours about intellectual property because we don't want him to fall asleep and get bored. What we want is that we want the game developer at the end of the day to say that I know how to strategically use my intellectual property. My business grew thanks to intellectual property. I found new business partners potentially. I met many great people from the industry. I have a new useful IP network across different countries and regions. And finally, I did not have to wear that tie for these kind of meetings. So thank you very much. This is the kind of broad overview of the project which we are currently considering. I mean, it, it is something that we will be doing. The details are being considered right now. But what I would like to use the opportunity with you is that since this is kind of a trailer, we're very much welcome uh, we would very much welcome any feedback you might have, as well as expression of interest if you want to be informed about the next stages of this project, or if you have any ideas you want to join it, please really do feel free to get, to get in touch with this because we're kind of inverting the approach. So we're speaking very much with the industry in order to make this as useful as possible. So we're very much would be happy to listen to the industry on what could be tweaked, what could be done better in order to make it more interesting and at the end of the day, useful to those SME game developers. So please feel free really to use my email and send whatever you would wish uh, to me so that we can eventually, of course, get in touch back with you. So thank you so much for your attention. Dziękuję, dziękuję za uwagę. Thank you for your attention. Duże, duże dziękuję. To był naprawdę duży ciekawy projekt i duży ciekawy koncept, jaki zrozumiałeś. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting concept and project, very open to people. I think it's uh, very interesting and a uh, big help for the industry. Uh, thank you uh, for to the department for, for supporting Ukraine, what you're doing for Ukraine. 
and I wish you all possible success in implementing the project. So let's continue. The next speaker is Marcin Sova from the Ministry of Development and Technology. I think it will be interesting for us to hear uh, about what the Ministry can do for game dev. I would like to... I wanted to thank very much the President of the Polish Patent Office for inviting me. I believe I must introduce myself. I deal with um, tax reliefs. In Poland we have such reliefs in the Polish tax reality. There is one on R&D and there is IP box, but my portfolio also includes the care for startups and the startup system and everything that is connected to it. Now, the subject of that panel and what my honorable predecessors said, the support for the game sector is so extensive that the elements that I deal with are but a small fraction of the whole system of support. Now, the previous speakers also mentioned so many different subjects, and I'm even glad that I don't have one coherent presentation. And I could be able to ask a question which is probably really raising hell, namely whether this sector really needs support. If we hear that the number of companies is developing employment, export and all that, that at the moment we export more products of that sector than we import to Poland and that this is something very important. The question is whether the question whether to support this sector is really justified. The question why should we provide support if as administration we need to support everything that is threatened with a market failure when things won't happen on their own. So on the one hand, as administration, those who provide support, we have to consider whether the funds that we would um, earmark for supporting gaming should not, from the perspective of the entire state, be devoted to other elements that won't develop on their own or that need support, which obviously does not mean that we would want the gaming sector to be somehow mm, stymied as this is a new subject. I'm, don't, I'm not saying that it's not going to be supported. I mean that it's important that everyone considers this subject because, of course, the resources are limited. It's never a bottomless pit you draw from. And there are some elements that need more support. And yet there are elements that certainly need no support at all. We have two feet on which we stand here and I have this perhaps doubtful pleasure that I have both these feet. One is this horizontal support to all the sectors and these include for example the tax reliefs, also everything that's connected to startup acceleration and also providing funds to startups, investing into startups so these are purely investment instruments that are done through high-risk instruments. So that's one foot and one leg. 
horizontal support without any indication of the sector. The other one is this point support. It's not only donations and where gaming is or was present, this support was for R&D and for internationalization. As soon as we move to what is closer to my heart, this horizontal support, I'd like to start from the startup thing. The, the gaming sector is present in the Polish ecosystem and we are moving away now from this point type support, support of the point type and detailed definition of what the given accelerator does, providing this public service of acceleration. There were such cases of those focused accelerators now. The Polish ecosystem has 20 accelerators and 20 acceleration programs conducted by private businesses. These are 25 POIR acceleration programs, 10 accelerators are there to support those purely Polish startups coming only from Poland without any sectoral um, alignment. There are 10 accelerators gathering talents all around the world, not only in the Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, but as experienced teachers, they are not majority. We invite talents from all over the world to arrive in Poland, to make their home here, to operate in the Polish ecosystem. And both these programs will operate for another two years. And it seems that the FENG do get used to FENG because POIR is being already are uh, turning into the past. There are no more elements there, but that's going to be FANG, and problems supporting acceleration are certainly going to be continued because we feel such a need. In this program, there will be acceleration for around a thousand startups. Well, both those that are fully Polish and those from Poland Prize Program, where you need to have foreign talent uh, developing, operating in Poland. So that's quite a large number. At the end of the program, we will know where these startups come from and what market niches they represent. I'm sure that the game uh, dev will be there as well. And I know that at least two accelerators of the 20 have their own gaming specialty. So I am convinced that gaming startups are there covered by this program and will remain there. These programs are closely connected to a program whose operator is Perfer Ventures, a daughter company of the Polish Development Fund, PFR, which uses public funds, also from POIR, to um, provide financing uh, to, to, to feed the Polish investment funds that invest in Polish innovative um, enterprises. There are more than 40 of those. They invest 
private and public funds, but in their investment aspect, the, these are made fully along market reasons. Prefer Ventures, for example, is a passive investor, and this is important because it cannot intervene in any way into what to invest, as decisive here is the assessment of the given um, fund. It's not about artificial life support. Just like in acceleration, we don't want any uh, artificial kiss of life. It's a developmental opportunity for the best only. If I hear that the British milieu uh, earmarked, what, eight million pounds, is it? Eight, another eight. And that's probably for gaming only. If we distributed what you get for gaming from Poland, I don't think that the amount would be below that uh, threshold. That would be at par. We had about 300 startup um, entries. That was 3.6 billion zloty. The data for the first quarter this year are an investment of 1 billion zloty into Polish startups. I can't, well, I've never had this need, I've never had this opportunity to see how much of the 4 billion went to gaming startups, but this can certainly be calculated. I don't believe that this is a neglectable uh, amount. Now, this Polish venture capital market, which is a litmus paper for this system will be developing uh, dynamically. The pandemic, the war on the other side of our eastern border, I don't believe that it will harm this in any way. And I'm very glad that this element of Poland Prize that's encouraging f foreign talents to arrive in Poland and to work here because there are really great uh, conditions, that it is developing very well. In the first pilot, we've had uh, 99 of those, and it's now going to be a multiple of the amount we've spent as yet. That's one place where gaming is not named, not listed by the name, but it makes use and it is supposed to make use. Now, the questions of investments, of acceleration, these are purely market decisions. We don't see the need to support any startup, and it's the market uh, that should decide who gets the money. Let's the best win, and I hope this is what's happening. That's what I wanted to say after what Mateusz said before me. Another thing, something that I deal most with, um, tax reliefs. Gaming is a specific branch, the R&D element here is present, even though it is, to use an appropriate word, kind of fishy or slippery, as R&D work in gaming, so in fact, production of software, as this is what it all boils down to, even though gaming is a more extensive notion, but tax reliefs are profiled in such a way that you can use it running your R&D. That's true for R&D, uh, where you need to create R&D costs, and then at the end you can clear them against your tax statement. 
So that's one thing. They are used by several thousand bodies nationally. I don't remember the exact numbers over 4,000. I believe it's um, about 5,000 businesses. Most of them pay corporate income tax but we also have those who pay personal income tax, uh, one-man bands as we call them, um, but uh, lion's share is uh, in the hands of the taxpayers who pay CIT. It's a very democratic um, relief because anyone who does R&D can receive it. As a game developer, as a game developer, I decide whether I do R&D or not. All that is kind of fishy, and it's all some way, you know, borderline. Considering whether it's worth it or not, I suggest that everyone reads the Frascati. Uh, book, not all the 450 pages, but from 60 to 85, you get a very easily explained notion of R&D work with specific subjects, also specific subjects for the IT sector, and of course gaming is a part of that. Another instrument that and I'm fully con sure that it's used by the gaming sector, is IP Box. It's quite a sophisticated tax instrument. Briefly speaking, this is a special way of taxing, low taxation. The IP tax is 5% for both PIT and CIT payers, and that's a tax relief that you can use when an entrepreneur commercializes their IP produced as the result of research and development. So again, this is another connection to uh, R&D. That's why I suggest you read the Frascati book so that we know that you generate R&D. And if I do, then how I monetize this R&D. Obviously, as I said, this is quite a sophisticated relief, but no nowhere in the world is that instrument simple. When we worked on it and we watched how it works in many countries, about four years ago in the UK, there were about 1,200 businesses using it. In the UK, in Belgium, a small country, there were about 200 of those. So if I say that in 2020, IPbox is used by 100 CIT taxpayers, and that was in the second year of the tax, I believe that this is a fantastic result. There were more than 4,500 PIT payers. Most of them are IT experts. Obviously, there is the act, there is also the reality of how you function in a given tax system. That, however, is beyond the Ministry of Development and Technology. However, there is such a practice that uh, the tax authorities demand individual tax interpretations, whether a given entrepreneur really runs R&D and how this can be translated into their revenue. Then someone who has such an interpretation can use IP box for taxing. I don't believe that the procedure here is complex and very expensive. As I said, nearly 4,500 PIT taxpayers use this instrument. Closing, may I mention those point-based instruments. The gaming sector is in the creative kiss, as we call it. That's why it can use support programs 
that prior to that were in smart development uh, operational program. We will be reviewing all the KISS programs. And the question is to what degree the support of the gaming sector and its R&D activity is of key importance. Would there be no R&D without this support? Perhaps they would be there and they need no support. Perhaps we should focus more on the element of internationalization. These are the questions that I hope could be later answered. And now it's the last thing I want to address. It's labor and education. It's a problem that we should consider. Administration won't cover everything. The sector won't cope itself either. Now, two examples where we are. There is one major pilot project, School for Innovator, that teaches innovative attitude about, among little kids, primary school children. And this is this uh, positive kick, teaching to work in a group, in a team, teaching cooperation. That's something that uh, my uh, neighbor d division does. And we do also other project, which is coding with the use of artificial intelligence. This pilot is interesting. And we know that the ministry would like to scale it up to 5,000 teachers and to do it to teach young people um, code and use artificial intelligence that's necessary for gaming. And I don't, my, my thoughts don't run that far ahead. Now, we run pilot projects and we test various solutions. We hope that they will be uh, coming to, to the final and that they will cover all the students of the schools in Poland. We realize that this is necessary for the game dev, but also for all the sectors that are and can uh, carry on new technologies. That's the briefest of the brief, and then thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marcin, for a very clear look at на відповідь на запитання, чи дійсно потрібно взагалі лізти і так підтримувати геймдев, чи він може сам впоратися з Тому ще раз дуже дякую. Uh, I think uh, the listeners from Ukraine found this very interesting. I think we are in time. I also have um, a subject uh, to cover. Uh, I hope you can see the presentation. It's a short one. Uh, today I would like to, um, apart from what we have already heard uh, on this session and in the previous ones, I want to talk um, um, I would like to talk about game dev how it um, uh, supports IP and how it impacts innovation worldwide mm. we have lost the signal. Так, 
вибачте. Отже, для мене, як для умовно геймера з доволі невеличким стажем, відеогра – це поєднання великої частини творчості і креативу разом із технологією. Це дуже велика частина теж – це технології, помножено на власне інтелектуальну власність. На захищену і незахищену інтелектуальну власність, на всі інститути, які геймдевелопер вміє застосовувати для свого продовження. Відеогеймс мають потенціал як продукт протектований IP law. This is quite a unique aspect because the consumers of the product, the gamers, can interface with a product which does have intellectual property enshrined, but at the same time um, consuming it, and it's also something that uh, is heavy in technology. Um, how does game dev um, impact the issues of IP? It changes technology, it changes uh, uh, application of copyright, new brands uh, that are commercialized are also developed and uh, changes also under um, will take place in society but I will touch on that later uh, also hardware is uh, being developed um, good hardware is needed for uh, good uh, code to be um, played um, so both hardware and software is uh, changing due to that and these solutions uh, can later be uh, applied uh, in other realms not necessarily the gaming industry what impact does the gaming uh, industry have uh, on the overall um, environment of intellectual property uh, it uh, leads to deve the development uh, of uh, new personal computers, new smartphones or consoles. There is a high correlation between how the game dev um, industry develops and uh, high uh, throughput telecoms uh, such as 5G. It um, induces gamers to purchase uh, new, better hardware, uh, so it uh, impacts uh, demand uh, for uh, equipment which uh, connects uh, uh, to high throughput internet. Uh, one of the patents shows Sony Interactive. Uh, it is uh, um, a patent protected uh, solution of um, uh, uh, controllers uh, for gaming, like a controller, for example. Looking like a banana, this uh, technology can be applied not necessarily in game dev. A game is uh, a product of high complexity, 80% of it is software that has an audiovisual interface. Uh, however, that is the, the, the software has the greatest carryover to development. Uh, 
other aspects uh, include virtual reality or augmented reality as well as AI. These technologies develop in the context of uh, heroes of the game and also new engines are established, developed and that offer <clears throat> a new level of resolution, much higher level. Mm, this is uh, related to the internal physics of the engine. It um, impacts modulation and dynamics, and this can also be applied in uh, military application uh, devices because it gives a very realistic experience. And this can be related to a whole new set of um, IP protection solutions and a whole new set of contention on the subject. Uh, some solutions have already been provided, uh, for example, uh, related to the hardware, computers and consoles for players, and there are protection um, measures uh, applied uh, both in the hardware and in the uh, software, and uh, if we talk about copyright, there are three different approaches. Which means that uh, the copyright is one of those uh, protection dimensions. And games allow um, developers to uh, create uh, new worlds. And uh, this includes the development of new um, objects uh, protected by copyright. And we also have examples where content is commercialized in the form of uh, separate merchandise. Online games develop new content related to the game itself, uh, and they can also be monetized in terms of revenue um, related to gaming itself. Uh, we also have open license game dev. Game developers use that. And there are also licenses um, in the Creative Commons scheme, and it licenses and other public licenses. That allows uh, for the production of high quality of games. Uh, this also helps to protect uh, small publishers small, medium-sized enterprises. The current platforms uh, can be applied for the development of high-quality products. Regarding other applications, uh, video games uh, can um, command the development of new streaming uh, solutions. This also includes um, some new IP challenges. For example, a concert uh, by Scott and Fortnite, which was uh, 
uh, attended by by many listeners by large audience uh, and that is an additional promotion of uh, or artistic creativity as regards brands uh, the gaming industry uh, opens a whole new world for um, the uh, companies um, uh, new brands uh, new trademarks are uh, being developed uh, they are um, protected by uh, intellectual property <coughs> rights also uh, individuals uh, heroes characters are uh, patented uh, Cross-licensing with other brands can also be applied. There is a small group, Terraria, which was um, developed by a small group of uh, authors. But uh, notwithstanding its small size, it um, registered 46 brands. And so in, in game dev, the, the use of trademarks in games, but also in, in esports, uh, in simulators, uh, 300 uh, um, football players um, wanted to uh, file a case in court against Electronic Arts uh, because uh, their uh, images had been used, uh, so that uh, causes new additional challenges uh, in the aspect of intellectual property. There are additional uh, influences. Um, one of them is psychological. Uh, in the darkness uh, that uh, Ukraine has found itself and uh, uh, the whole of Eastern Europe, due to the pandemic and the war, and that has translated into the sales of video games. In uh, some areas, the uh, growth of sales uh, was as high as 40 percent. <coughs> this uh, helps people to unwind reduce their stress um, and alleviate uh, a sense of solitude uh, because gaming also allows us to come into touch with uh, other players in children it helps uh, develop motor skills uh, we have been discussing uh, game dev uh, with, with its impact uh, on the economy uh, and uh, economic growth. Uh, we have been uh, stating that game dev should be supported not only in terms of intellectual property, but we should also, or we may also consider how a game dev can help us uh, in uh, opposing external aggression as in the war in Ukraine. One of uh, the companies uh, uh, offered us uh, practical uh, assistance um, in terms of uh, monetary support. Uh, Ukrainian uh, game dev companies uh, are also supporting us. They launched a campaign um, to support the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, they collected um, $800,000 for, for the armed forces, and uh, therefore we can say that Ukraine is not only celebrating IP Day, uh, but also the, 30, the 36th uh, anniversary uh, of uh, the disaster in Chernobyl. Uh, so if you uh, 
you hear me talking about stalker, this is not uh, uh, a commercial promotion. I just want to make it known that uh, sales of, of certain games are uh, being performed as fundraising for Ukraine. Um, we currently have uh, a special legal framework and an educational uh, system. Um, all this is to um, offer tax breaks and uh, um, legal support for game dev companies. And this uh, relates to uh, companies which uh, are mostly active in uh, mobile gaming. Uh, we uh, are in contact with many companies that uh, uh, are going to take advantage of the IP box system, although uh, the, its implementation has been suspended recently. Uh, the Ukrainian government has also been uh, offering um, financial support uh, for creative industries, and uh, these um, monetary um, this monetary assistance uh, is, has the form of grants which are not repayable. Um, this is a game um, uh, where uh, uh, the gamer uh, can be a tractor driver uh, which drags away uh, Russian uh, war warfare hardware. Um, uh, thank you for, for this meeting. I, I wish you a continuing fruitful discussion, uh, and I hope that uh, soon uh, uh, we, the Ukrainians, will, uh, will join uh, these processes and procedures. Uh, I would like to thank our Polish colleagues and uh, the uh, European and world institutions uh, for providing us this um, opportunity uh, of uh, exchanging our views and um, finding common understanding. And uh, it is up to me to terminate this session, so I close it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to close the conference commemorating or embellishing, celebrating and observing the World IP Day. May I provide this closing remark? It's been a long day. When we intended to do it, it was supposed to be a bit limited due to the pandemic and due to this online form. We're very glad that we've managed to expand this formula. And what I believe we've tried to show today to our audience here in Poland and abroad is a particular continuity and a path from the creativity of the innovative solutions by the young who, thanks to this unlimited potential of creativity, are capable of generating various forms of innovation, in this case in the game dev sector, but also to show you how important in this process is the care for the protection of intellectual property rights, how important it is that representing various um, institutions, we develop instruments supporting the whole process. Hence, 
we should uh, realize why there is such a broad interest and why various milieus are involved here. May I thank the members of the panel? The gentlemen here represent the last part of our conference, but may I thank all those who have partaken in it. And I believe that as a representative of the Polish Patent Office of Public Administration, I see before us an extremely important task so that we take a more extensive look also by doing our everyday job and listening to what young people need, to what they want to have. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what can I say? We've organized the conference with co-organizer being the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute in partnership with World Intellectual Property Organization as every year with the uh, European Union IPO with the honor and we worked under the honorary patronage under the Polish Ministry of Culture and National, National Heritage. May I thank you all, and may I continue on what President Dembeshivak said in the opening of the conference. However, I believe that this is important to return. I'm so glad that despite such uh, difficult, such difficult circumstances, we've had here in our office, representatives of the Ukrainian Intellectual Property Institute. I observed this tradition. We had a lot of followers. We had a lot of our Ukrainian friends participating. Ladies and gentlemen, in this difficult time, extremely difficult time, I'd like to express my recognition and respect for your attitude that you work despite war. And that is certainly the best proof that Ukraine as a state shall not die. For you are there. Your service, your devotion in various fields today, we saw it in intellectual property, it cannot simply be over-appreciated. In the context of Easter, we celebrated less than two weeks ago and celebrated by the Orthodoxy last week, the Veligden. Peace, peace to all of you. Let this be the best wishes for this difficult time. Ladies and gentlemen, we would not have met if not for the participation of my colleagues from the Polish Patent Office. I'd like to thank them very warmly for that now. I hope I'm not going to skip any names. This project has been quite a challenge, especially due to this hybrid form. May I thank the Department of Communication and Innovation Support represented by Director Richard Kondratiuk. That's the department that bore the brunt of organization of this conference uh, celebrating the World IP Day. I'm also uh, thanking Anja Dachowska and the International Cooperation Department, the IT Department, Digitalization Department, the Administrative Office. And as we are here in this mixed formula, I'll try, I hope I will succeed, to do something. You've seen our stage. Now you will see the backstage. This is to honor all those who have participated in this conference. I'm going to thank all of you. So now, 
I will try to do something so that we can see everyone. Here we have our invaluable interpreters. We'd like to thank them very much for today. We had Ukrainian and uh, English as well as Polish. Jarek from the IT department, our invaluable transmissions guys with Małgosia from the communications department, Marek who supervised everything. And then we have the other interpreters plus the representatives of the communication and innovation support department. Under the lead of Dr. Kondratiuk with Dr. Balitsky at the back. He decided to stay with us throughout the time. I'd like to thank you for all of that. Ladies and gentlemen, let these last pictures be a form of expressing an expression of gratitude to everyone. Once again, the best wishes, plenty of support to our Ukrainian friends. I'd like to thank all those who have been with us online. Hope to see you not next year on the IP day, because our office is a very active one, and still in May we will meet again.